Coming up on Science and Technology Week, staring into space, the upgraded Hubble telescope gives new insights on black holes and the birth and death of stars. Hello and welcome. I'm Ann Kellen. NASA astronomers are thrilled with the latest results from the Hubble Space Telescope. Upgraded instruments are peering into distant parts of the universe and revealing details that were invisible until now. A team of spacewalking astronauts visited the Hubble Space Telescope in February to service and upgrade it. The newly installed instruments are still in the checkout and calibration stage, but first results have scientists starry-eyed. This machine never ceases to amaze me. I mean, it's already producing incredible new science. One of the instruments is giving new insight into supermassive black holes, regions in space with such strong gravitational pull that nothing escapes them, not even light. The Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, or STIS for short, found the evidence of a black hole in a galaxy called M84, 50 million light years away. STIS looks at objects through a narrow slit, that blocks out competing light and reveals a disk of gas orbiting the black hole. It took the instrument only 20 minutes to do what used to take 40 times as long. STIS has made it look easy to do something that was previously very taxing for Hubble, possible but very taxing for Hubble to do, and that is to ro relatively routinely and, and, and easily detect a supermassive black hole in the nucleus of galaxies. STIS also provided a new way to analyze the rings of a giant dying star, or supernova, called 1987A, and to study its geometry. The other new instrument is the Near-Infrared Camera and Multi-Object Spectrometer, NICMOS for short. NICMOS has expanded Hubble's range of vision into the near-infrared and has expanded the clarity with which we can see the universe into places that we couldn't see before, into dusty regions, uh, housing newborn stars and housing stars going through the process of, of their death throes. This is how the older Hubble cameras saw the Orion Nebula. NICMOS reveals features that couldn't be seen before in a region where new stars are coming into existence. NICMOS offers similar detail of the Egg Nebula where a star is dying. And NICMOS isn't running at full power. One of its three cameras is not working right. Since the upgrade mission, a block of nitrogen ice used for cooling has pushed the camera out of focus. NASA hopes the ice will gradually evaporate and the problem will fix itself. If not, the agency may try refocusing the Hubble for a brief period so that the camera can carry out its mission. NASA officials say there is no doubt the Hubble is worth its price tag. We spent up to this point about $3 billion, I believe, on Hubble from about 1979 through 1997. That works out to be about uh, two cents a week per American. If you think it's worth it, come with me on one of my trips or one of my colleagues' trips to a third grade class showing students galaxies at the edge of the universe, black holes, planets, Mars, and watch their eyes light up, their hands go up. I think that's the real value of Hubble. It's not how many articles it puts in the Astrophysical Journal or, or how many papers in various journals. It's, you know, what it does for the country in, in terms of exciting kids, getting them interested in school again. And they say the scientific discoveries are likely to just keep getting better. A new discovery about gamma rays is being hailed by astronomers. One of them calls it the discovery of the year. Scientists from Caltech captured an image of a gamma ray burst that flared briefly on May 8th. It's the first time scientists have measured the distance and intensity of one of them. Bursts of gamma radiation happen several times every day, but they're not well understood. The Caltech researchers say the burst on May 8th came from far outside our galaxy, and during the 10 seconds it existed, it put out as much energy as our sun will in its entire 10 billion year life. But the new findings still don't explain what causes these bursts. The space agency NASA has released spectacular new images from the Hubble Space Telescope. The pictures provide what astronomers are calling astronomers are calling the best, clearest views ever of the planet Mars. And those views are challenging some old ideas about our neighboring planet. CNN's Kalen Thomas Samuel has more.
Hubble Space Telescope images of the planet Mars have astronomers rethinking their ideas about weather on the red planet. When the Viking landers sent back the first photos of Mars in the late 1970s, the planet appeared to be dry and dusty. Now scientists say new data indicates Mars has a colder, cloudier season, too. There are really are two distinct climates of Mars. There's a climate of Mars when Mars is nearest to the sun, and there's a climate of Mars when Mars is furthest from the sun. The Viking and uh, 1977 uh, mission Viking and 72 mission Mariner 9 to Mars saw the dusty climate of Mars when Mars was nearest to the sun. When the Pathfinder probe lands on Mars and deploys a small rover on July 4th, Scientists expect to see a very different Mars than they've seen before. When the Pathfinder lands in July, if these clouds remain, and, and they may or may not because this is very chaotic switching between these two climates, what we should see is actually a very, very dark, darkish, perhaps slightly bluish sky with brilliant white clouds against the sky. Scientists also say Hubble has provided them with new pictures of Mars's polar ice caps, which shrink considerably when the planet is closest to the sun. And Hubble is helping astronomers better understand the changing appearance of surface features on the planet. Light reddish areas are covered in a fine, light-colored dust, while darker areas are bare rock. As the dust shifts with the wind, rocky areas are alternately exposed or covered. Scientists say the new findings about Martian climate and weather make Mars a more exciting planet to study. A sky in, in the, the dust storm period is it's something like a very smoggy Los Angeles sky, uh, perhaps beautiful in its own way, but I would say that the clouds and the, <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> the, clouds and the very dark uh, uh, bluish sky, I think, uh, make it much more Earth-like, at least uh, uh, emotionally. And uh, I think that makes it a more appealing planet, actually. Over the next year, astronomers say Hubble, Pathfinder, and another probe called the Mars Global Surveyor, which will orbit and map Mars, should greatly increase our understanding of the planet next door. Kaylin Thomas Samuel, CNN reporting. Hello and welcome. I'm Ann Kellen. Thousands of icy comets the size of small houses are bombarding the Earth's atmosphere 24 hours a day. Sounds unreal. But this week, scientists debuted a series of images they say offers compelling evidence that these small comets are showering the planet all the time. Thousands of comets hit the Earth's atmosphere every day. This image shows one small comet captured by an ultraviolet camera, breaking up and turning into water vapor, according to scientist Louis Frank. He presented his findings right. to scientists at the meeting of the American Geophysical Union. We find uh, objects coming in at about the rate of 20 every minute, one every three seconds, okay? It looks like a small, small two-bedroom house, all right? And that weighs 20 to 40 tons. Frank captured these images from cameras on board the Polar Satellite, cameras that he developed after earlier and cruder satellite data he had collected and analyzed was ridiculed. Ten years ago, Lewis Frank presented the same small comet theory to the scientific community. He even wrote a book on the issue. The scientific community did not take it seriously. Well, ten years and three new cameras later, scientists are listening. The images show what Frank describes as small, loosely packed snowballs encased in shells. As they approach the Earth's atmosphere, these comets break apart, producing clouds of water. They don't contain the dust and metals of bigger comets. They don't have those things that glow so brightly that you would see. If they were built like real, you know, like the big comets, then you see these fantastic glows in the sky. Instead, they are dull glowers, he says, made up of oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon that break up into separate gases and Frank theorizes shower the Earth, resulting in about one inch of water every 10,000 years. There are still skeptics. Other scientists say the existence of small comets is just a hypothesis. They'll feel more comfortable when others see the small comets, too. If only Lou Frank with this one instrument can see them, and there's no confirming evidence from uh, subsidiary experiments, uh, then the hypothesis will die. NASA is backing Frank's claim with some reservation. NASA is not yet convinced that we know how many of these and how much they weigh and how much water they're providing to the Earth. But it's obvious to us there are dark spots in our satellite pictures and there are incoming water-bearing objects. Scientists have long theorized that billions of years ago, large comets slammed into the Earth, seeding the Earth with minerals and chemicals. 
Frank says if his theory holds, these smaller ice comets he discovered might be what's been filling Earth's oceans for billions of years. 25 years ago, figuring out where a hurricane was headed was a roll of the dice. But a lot has changed. We are improving. No question about it. We're getting a lot better. We have to attribute that almost exclusively to improvements in technology. Satellites, sophisticated weather instruments, and computers make the difference. Forecasters at the National Hurricane Center in Miami say since the 1960s, the number of miles they are off in projecting landfall has been cut in half to 85 miles. Last year, when Hurricane Lily was moving over Cuba, hurricane specialists decided, based upon all the best computer models, would simulate what the atmosphere is going to do over the next two to three days. Not to issue warnings for the Florida Keys, because they were confident the storm would turn. It did. We have uh, two or three models that are better than anything we had five years ago. And uh, so we're catching a lot of sharp turns that we would not have caught before. And the better they are at forecasting what path a hurricane will take, the more money people will save. On average, hurricanes and tropical storms cause $5 billion a year in damage. Experts believe increasingly precise forecasts could save half a billion dollars annually by giving people more time to prepare. And a new Hurricane Hunter jet flying for the first time this season will bring them information they never had before. Information they hope reduces the error even more. Unlike other Hurricane Hunters, the jet will not fly into storms. It will fly the current, the stream of air hundreds of miles away, which influences a hurricane's movement. If you were to throw a block of wood in the water and you wanted to know where it's going, you'd look at the stream of water, not the block of wood. The improvements could not have come at a better time. Like the past two, the 1997 hurricane season is expected to be active. If the forecast for 11 storms is right, the three-year period will have been the busiest in 100 years of record-keeping. John Zarella, CNN, Miami. As the sun goes down in Southern California, there is anticipation along the darkening coastline. El Nino is coming back, say the fishermen, and with it... Giant squid! Gigantic squid! Indeed, the fishing has been great both night and day. Right. A lot of exotic fish headed this way. Yep. From the fisherman's standpoint, we think that there's something going on. Something has been going on, but it's thousands of miles to the south and probably has nothing to do with California fishing. For the first time, scientists are predicting an El Nino weather pattern based on changes picked up by a NASA satellite over the South Pacific. Prevailing westerly trade winds have shifted to the east, pushing warm tropical water along with them. You can see this uh, band of uh, red and yellow, uh, which means warm water, parting up in the eastern Pacific as opposed to western Pacific. El Nino can affect weather around the world for one to two years. It can mean heavy winter rains in the western U.S. In the east, winters are warmer and the hurricane season is mild. And as far away as Africa, there can be severe drought. The El Nino weather pattern is not completely understood. For one, it arrives randomly, roughly every two to seven years. Also, its effects are not always the same. For example, four of the last five produced heavy West Coast rain, but one did not. Scientists say the important factor this year is the precise satellite imaging and information. Now we simultaneously have these two important pieces of information about the ocean currents and winds, which are being fed to weather agencies to improve their forecast. Beachgoers and others along the coast continue to link El Nino to everything from bad sunburns to good fishing. Much is unfounded. But scientists may have found a way to predict the pattern and learn more about its effects. Jim Hill, CNN, Los Angeles. Am 96. Mal ist die europäische Trägerrakete Ariane vom Raumfahrtbahnhof in Französisch-Guayana aus ins All gestartet. 
Der Start verlief planmäßig, nachdem er wegen der Überprüfung einer Batterie um 22 Minuten verschoben werden musste. Die Ariane 4 hatte zwei Fernmeldesatelliten mit einem Gesamtgewicht von 4,5 Tonnen an Bord. Einen, der Fernsehbilder nach Indien übertragen soll und einen zweiten, der den mobilen Funkverkehr auf See gewährleistet. Eine europäische Ariane-Rakete hat in der Nacht zwei Fernmeldesatelliten ins All gebracht. Der seit Jahresbeginn vierte Start vom Raumfahrtzentrum Kourou in französisch Guayana verlief planmäßig. Die Ariane 4 setzte über dem Westatlantik einen britischen Satelliten aus. Dieser vervollständigt ein weltweites Mobiltelefonnetz. Außerdem wurde über den Malediven ein Fernmeldesatellit der indischen Weltraumorganisation ISRO platziert. Cayenne, die Hauptstadt. 40.000 Einwohner. Zentrum der ehemaligen Sträflingskolonie. Hier lebt die Mehrzahl der insgesamt 12.000 Franzosen. Sie sind die Minderheit, aber sie haben das Gesetz des Handelns in der Hand. Der Palmenplatz. 100-jährige Bäume eingerahmt von Prachtbauten aus der Kolonialzeit. Sie halten der schwarzen und indianischen Bevölkerung täglich vor Augen, auf welchen Wurzeln das heutige französisch Guyana gründet. Eine geschäftige Hauptstraße, doch viel ist nicht los in Cayenne. Die schwüle Hitze lähmt jeden Elan. Und Zeit spielt keine Rolle. Selten bin ich so liebenswürdigen, aber auch unpünktlichen Menschen begegnet. Hohe Arbeitslosigkeit, doch in den Statistiken wird die wirtschaftliche Stagnation übertüncht durch die Tatsache, dass viele Bürger Sozialhilfe erhalten. Ein Denkmal erinnert an Viktor Schölcher, der für die Abschaffung der Sklaverei in den französischen Kolonien kämpfte und sie 1848 auch endlich durchsetzte. Doch 150 Jahre danach haben Teile der Bevölkerung immer noch den Eindruck, unter einer Kolonialherrschaft zu leben. Freiheit fordern sie immer wieder bei ihren Demonstrationen. Guyana wird erwachen und sich erheben, so der Refrain. Doch bei südamerikanischen Rhythmen klingt das nicht so bedrohlich. Auf Transparenten klagen sie Grundrechte ein und ein Ende des aus ihrer Sicht repressiven Regimes. Frankreich denkt jedoch nicht daran, Cayenne in die Unabhängigkeit zu entlassen. Schließlich liegt hier das europäische Raumfahrtzentrum, ein Glanzstück moderner Technologie, auf das die Franzosen so stolz sind. Von hier aus, von Kourou, bringt die Ariane-Rakete Satelliten in den Weltraum. Deutsche Unternehmen sind mit knapp 19 Prozent an der Ariane beteiligt. Im Vier-Wochen-Rhythmus ist jeweils eine neue Rakete startbereit. Hierfür kommen jedes Mal ein Dutzend Techniker aus Deutschland angereist, um die mitgebrachten Bauteile auf die Rakete zu montieren. Da bleibt dann noch etwas Zeit, das fremde tropische Land zu erkunden. Doch begeistert sind die deutschen Techniker von französisch Guyana nicht. Wir kommen hierher, um zu arbeiten. Und also in Urlaub, äh, glaube ich, würde hier keiner herkommen. Weil es eigentlich zu wenig gibt, um Freizeitgestaltung zu machen. Es ist nicht das so gegeben, wie man es eigentlich erwartet. Ne? Also den, den äh, Strand oder äh, Sehenswürdigkeiten oder so. Es, es gibt nicht viel zu tun hier. Ne? Spezielle Angebote für Touristen gibt es kaum. Dafür unberührte Natur und ein faszinierendes Wechselspiel von bedrohlichen Regenwolken und blauem Himmel. Das Wetter kann innerhalb von fünf Minuten umschlagen. Die Erinnerungen an die Zeiten des Straflagers sind überall präsent. Der Leuchtturm wurde nach Dreifuß benannt. Versuch einer Wiedergutmachung? Ein von der Welt vergessenes Stück Erde. Wer weiß schon, dass dies zu Frankreich gehört. Nur alle vier Wochen gibt es eine Nachricht. Meist eine Erfolgsmeldung, wenn die Rakete wieder über dem Urwald hochgegangen ist. Welcome back to Late Edition. I'm Gene Randall. Ever been to Roswell, New Mexico? Are you from this planet? Here is Bruce Morton. Bruce? Well, I guess the last word for this week, Gene, is look. <laughs> 50 years ago this month, a rancher near Roswell, New Mexico, found wreckage, wood sticks, tinfoil, scotch tape. A legend was born. The Air Force said, no, it was a weather balloon. No, it was another kind of balloon. And those little human-looking figures, we used them in impact tests. But thousands say no. Aliens landed. And Roswell is planning a big party, kind of Woodstock Astral, for the 50th anniversary. Whatever happened, over half of us believe intelligent life is out there somewhere, and a third of us think it has visited Earth. And whatever we think, we fantasize and wonder. <laughs> Would the aliens be tough, like the alien? Would Sigourney Weaver save us? Would they attack as an independence day? Would they be cute, like E.T.? 
menacing like the Borg in First Contact. Destroy them. Friendly, as in Close Encounters. Mean, as in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. They have to be destroyed, all of them. We wonder. NASA, for years, though no longer, had a program of scanning radio frequencies, looking for pattern transmissions, signs of life from out there. In this summer's movie, Contact, they find some. It is one of our oldest dreams. They come, the alien beings, to solve our problems with their wisdom or their death rays. They offer us a trip to planets we have never seen, and we say yes or no. We know they're out there somehow. What about those lights over Phoenix last March? Are they real? Will they find us? Keep watching the sky. First, that is very big business in Roswell, New Mexico. Do they do it well? Well, this is the, the biggest. It's 50 years, you know, but it's sort of, it's going to be their Woodstock, I think. The T-shirts are there. The little plastic figures are there. They're ready. So it is their Elvis century, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Museums sure. and everything else. Yeah, not quite that formal, but, you know, people will come. There'll be music. There'll be things to do. And uh, who knows, you know, if they're really lucky, some saucer's going to come down and everybody's going to, hey, they were right. But bottom line, a large segment of this population believes something half, is going on. Half of us believe there's intelligent life out there somewhere, which is not unreasonable, all those planets, all those stars. Uh, a third of us believe that they've come here, which is a little harder. Well, hopefully we'll have more intelligent life here to match them. Thanks, Bruce. Please roll the video. pretty quick. Uh, I'm going to start off some Air Force high altitude balloon operations, and the first project is going to be a NASA uh, Viking space probe tested in New Mexico. This was launched from Roswell, New Mexico in 1972 and is recovered on the White Sands missile range, about 100 miles to the west. That is the Voyager Mars, another test here for the state also. This is a uh, typical Air Force high altitude uh, balloon launch operation in the desert of New Mexico. This is during the mid 50s. That's just a comparison of the size. You can see how many airliners you could fit inside a high altitude research balloon at altitude. These are just uh, some payloads. Unusual payloads, not typically associated with a balloon. Next will be the Reconnaissance Project Mogul. The project took place in New Mexico in 1947. This is some equipment associated with Project Mogul. There's the famous box kite that became the famous flying disc. The weather balloons that were on the on the balloon train. That's the tinfoil paper, rubber, and sticks that they recovered in the desert near New Mexico in, in New Mexico in 1947. Here's what you've all been waiting for, the anthropomorphic dummies and Joseph W. Kittinger, Jr. That's a <laughs> Typical test dummy used by the Air Force during the 1950s. There's one of the project officers with that particular dummy known as a Sierra Sam, manufactured by Sierra Engineering Corporation. One of the technical reports uh, listed in the bibliography of the report. This is actually a manned subject, but what, that's what the dummies were used for to test ejection. So that's not a dummy? That's a man. <laughs> here's, some, here's how the dummies were employed. Uh, two dummies to Iraq, uh, somewhere in a, in a gondola. Uh, they flew up to 98,000 feet. This launch is in, is in New Mexico. That's an upshot, and there goes the dummy. He would free fall for a period of time, and a drogue chute would deploy, and the object was to recover a, a human from a high altitude aircraft. 
They often landed at off-range locations throughout New Mexico, often, often observed by civilians. This is where the recovery crews would scurry in to recover them, either with aircraft or with ground vehicles. This is uh, retired Colonel Joseph W. Kittinger, Jr. This is the culmination of the high-altitude uh, projects that used the dummies. And that's the Excelsior, Excelsior III gondola in 1960. And that's Captain Kittinger. That is a world record parachute jump, still stands today. He <laughs> free fell for four minutes and 37 seconds. And he did it three times. <coughs> <laughs> okay, let me, yes ma'am. Why did it take so long to come up with this conclusion? You've come up with many other conclusions. Well, the first report was the GAO required report for Project Mogul. When Captain Gandry was doing additional research after that report had been given to the secretary and we were waiting to publish the second report, he was looking for additional pictures and he uncovered some film strips of the balloon test and the dummies. And that's when he began to do further research. He sent it up the chain and they said, this is excellent information. It's outstanding uh, uh, scientific research by the Air Force and we want the public to know about it because it's the public's information. Colonel, how do you square uh, the UFO enthusiasts saying that uh, they're talking about 1947 well, you're talking about dummies used in the uh, in the 50s, almost a decade later. Well, I'm afraid that's the problem that we have with time compression. I don't know what they saw in 47, but I'm quite sure it probably was Project Mogul. But I think if you find that people talk about things over a period of time, they begin to lose exactly when the date was. And there were lots of dummies dropped. There were 20, about 2,500 balloons launched during this 30-year period in New Mexico alone. Uh, does the Air Force have any evidence at all of any sort of uh, spacecraft wreckage or extraterrestrial presence uh, on Earth? Yes, sir. And what is, uh, can you tell us anything about this myth of Area 51, which has become part of uh, <laughs> everything from Hollywood movies to a local legend? What, what is Area 51? Is there such a place? And what does it do? That actually should be outside this brief. Let me ask you a question. Are, if you are talking about Groom Lake, Nevada, is that what you're talking about? I'm talking about the scene everybody remembers from the movie Independence Day. <laughs> my, ta my daughter asked me the same question. There is a uh, facility in Groom Lake, Nevada. Quite frankly, I have no knowledge or expertise in the matters. I understand there are classified things that go on there, and that's all I have to say about it. Well, let me just add one follow-up. How do you know, I mean, your name is now Colonel John Haynes is going to go down in UFO lore as <laughs> one of the people who, who took part in the minds of some people in the continuing cover-up by the government. How do you know that you're not being used? How do you know that you know the full story when you <laughs> tell us that there's no evidence of it? Because our job is to review all the Air Force documents for this era. And that's how we came up with this exciting and interesting and intriguing, quite frankly, report. I know you, you think that sounds like a broken record, but you need to get in here and read it, and you will see that many of the things that people think they saw correlate perfectly with Air Force research projects. So you're confident that you're not part of any cover-up, wittingly or unwittingly? I'm totally confident. But I think Colonel Weaver, you might have seen him on TV earlier, said it best, we can't even keep single secrets. How could we have a conspiracy or a cover-up? Well, I think, uh, for one thing, I, mean, I think the, the Air Force has, uh, has been in the, uh, the UFO business for a while. I mean, as far as I know, they've never investigated uh, vampires. They've never investigated fairies. But they did, um, you know, they, it was the Army Air Force which announced in 1947 that there had been a, uh, a crash of a UFO in Roswell, New Mexico. They quickly retracted that, but they did make that official announcement. And they did... Um, I'm not entirely conversant with this, but they, they did do, uh, I believe in the 50s and 60s, they, there was something called Project Blue Book where they did, you know, they did investigate uh, UFOs coming to the conclusion that there was, there was nothing extraterrestrial to it. But, um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, there is, I mean, or people mentioned at the, uh, the press conference, there is, you know, theoretically a, a national security component to this. If this was, you know, if, if this is real, if this was real, you know, there was, it is something that, you know, the government and, and of course, the, uh, you know, national security groups would have to take seriously. So I think, I think that's 
why, and then I guess also because I think in this case that the Air Force was saying, well, that, that they were actually, uh, they were conducting experiments that, that people mis misperceived as, uh, you know, being of extraterrestrial origin. So I think that's, you know, that's some of the answer. Well, um, let me ask you to your mind, does the Air Force account of the experiments it was conducting make sense? Does it explain what needs to be explained when we look at Roswell? I think uh, I, I think it's a big part of it. Yeah, I, I think you know this, this gets to the aspect of whether there were actually um, you know alien bodies out in the uh, out in the desert there. And I think you know at least to, to my you know what I understand of human nature, it certainly makes sense to me that somebody might see you know a strange dummy out in the desert and you know 30, 40 years later hear talk about UFOs and say, oh yeah, I think yeah maybe I did see something and maybe it was in 1947 and not in you know 1954. You know I mean I think that's the you know, that the human mind uh, works that way. So that certainly seems, um, it, it seems plausible to me. Now, you mentioned one of the issues that a lot of people bring up, 1957, 1954. Uh, the years don't seem to all correlate quite as neatly as they should. If there were to have been dummies at Roswell instead of uh, aliens, is that a big problem, do you think, for the, uh, for the account that the Air Force wants to put forward, that they can't supply the right kind of events on the right kind of dates? Well, I don't think, I mean, I think a couple of things. One, I think it's not, I mean, it's not, it's not up to the Air Force to prove conclusively that there weren't, uh, that there weren't extraterrestrials. I mean, I think it's up to the, you know, it's up to the UFO community to prove, you know, to prove what they're asserting. Um, and secondly, I mean, I think, you know, people's minds, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm 38. I, you know, sometimes have a hard time remembering what year something happened in the 70s. I mean, if I, you know, you know, add another 30, 40 years to my life and put the events even further back, I mean, you know, people... You know the human uh, you know, memory is very malleable, so I don't. You know that doesn't that that aspect of it doesn't surprise me. What about the people in the immediate area of Roswell itself? What do they think about all this? Are they annoyed by it? Are they well, amused I, by it? I talked to a lot of them. I mean, the the the, the attitude I, I seem to find more more so than anything else was, was kind of amusement at it. Um, you, you heard a lot of and you heard a lot of people. I asked a lot of people, and there was almost a. a a kind of response that, that I got across the board was, well, I'm not sure what, I believe something happened. I'm not sure it was extraterrestrial, but I'm not sure the government was telling us the truth either. They're kind of, you know, they're sort of finding some uh, middle ground there. But uh, partly what's interesting is that, that it was something that was ignored in Roswell for, for years until I believe the late, late 80s was when the first UFO museum came up. And now they're kind of, um, they're starting to realize that it's something they can make a little money off of. They're kind of encouraging UFO tourism. There's, there's all kinds of industries popping up. They make UFO lollipops. They make UFO Christmas ornaments. They make UFO refrigerator magnets. So they're, they're kind of, they're realizing that it's something that they can exploit. And, and some people are still a little embarrassed about it. I mean, you hear people say, well, I don't want to be known as Cooktown. But um, on the other hand, people are realizing, well, here we have something that uh, can, draw, can draw visitors to our town and put us on the national map and, you know, put a little money in our pockets. And, and what would visitors find if they go there? Can you go to the actual site of uh, of the incident, whatever it was? Well, uh, it's kind of um, it gets tricky because there's uh, I'm not even I think there's like four or five or six different sites that different people have 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 claimed where they saw UFOs. There is there's one where you can go uh, that's owned by a a, a, a local rancher, and uh, you can go out and they give you uh, they'll give you like a tour of their place. Um, you can go, you see a couple, uh, you know, there's a couple UFO museums where they have, they have exhibits, they have little, you know, they have kind of dioramas of what the crash might have looked like. They have, uh, I remember seeing, uh, they didn't actually have uh, debris from the UFO crash, but they had, you know, like old, old Coke cans and stuff like that that had been out that they had recovered from the debris field. So this was at least a, a Coke can that was in, um, you know, possibly in the presence of extraterrestrials. So it, that's the kind of stuff that you're going uh, you're gonna to see out there. Do you believe in UFOs? Uh, no, not really. I, I would like to. I, I certainly do. I personally believe that there, there, are, there is probably intelligent life somewhere in the universe. I think, I do think though, if, if uh, they were coming to visit us, I think there, there'd be more concrete evidence of it. I wish they were. I would certainly, I would like to know more about what's out there. I, I think I'd be very disappointed if I, uh, if uh, we haven't made contact with you, if, uh, with extraterrestrials before, uh, before I die. But uh, I kind of, I sort of doubt it. Bruce Handy of Time Magazine. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. I guess I believe that there were at least three alien bodies on board this vehicle that did crash. 
It's a story many have come to believe since a Roswell, New Mexico rancher in 1947 found a strange wreckage on his land. The military first said it was a flying saucer, then the next day a weather balloon. In 1994, the Pentagon reported it was really a top-secret spying device to detect Soviet nuclear blasts. This week, the Air Force will release a second report, claiming aliens sighted were really vinyl plastic dummies that dropped from balloons to test the impact from high-altitude parachute jumps. And these dummies, of which there are several different types, uh, had these kind of non-specific features. They were dressed in flight suits. Um, and there's a good table of comparison, as well as lots of photographs in this book that uh, that will show the comparison between statements of people who claimed they saw something strange and what was actually being tested in the desert at that time. But those tests didn't take place until the early 1950s, three years after the Roswell sightings. Colonel Weaver, who edited the report, says the Pentagon believes witnesses simply got the year wrong. UFO researchers don't buy that. I think it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. But I don't, bl I don't really fault the Air Force people that are putting out this absolute nonsense because they don't have a choice. They have not been told the truth. They're not in the loop. The Air Force report comes as yet another explanation appears in popular mechanics that the Roswell wreckage was an incendiary balloon piloted by Japanese. With the latest flurry of UFO sightings in Arizona, neither Douglas nor Weaver believes the new Air Force report will end the speculation. I, we're certainly not going to dissuade everybody, and I, the report was never intended to, to finally prove to everybody that they were wrong. Roswell is not going to go away because the UFOs are not going away, apparently. Kathleen Koch for CNN, Washington. Now at age 75, U.S. Senator John Glenn wants to do it all over again. The space agency, NASA, is reportedly considering Glenn's idea to help study the effects of space travel on aging. John Glenn circled the Earth three times in 1962 on board Mercury 6. A return to space would make him the oldest human ever in orbit. And that's it for this edition of World News. I'm Jim Clancy. Thanks for staying with us. Stay tuned now. World Sport is coming up next. Thirty-five years ago, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. It was Glenn's only trip into space, but it made him a national hero. The past 22 years, Glenn has served in the U.S. Senate. In 1984, he made an unsuccessful bid for president. Glenn, now 75, announced earlier this year his retirement from the Senate. When I leave the Senate, it will not be an end. But a new beginning. That new beginning may include a return to space. Glenn has said many times he wants to be the first in line if NASA needs a volunteer for a study on how weightlessness would affect an older person. And a NASA spokesman told the Orlando Sentinel that the space agency is interested in research on the aging process in space and it's been discussed with Glenn. There is consideration of a mission that would make Glenn the oldest American to orbit the Earth, he said but nothing has been decided. When Glenn announced his retirement, he did so to a group of college students, telling them about the exciting future of space travel. I am envious. I wish I was your age to start and go into some of this with you and be able to share some of this with you. And don't count me out yet, I'm gonna be around for a while. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and after the shuttle Challenger exploded in 1986, killing teacher Krista McAuliffe, NASA abandoned its program to send non-scientist civilians into space. Ancient is on green, shoot is out in reach condition at 10,800 feet and beautiful shoot. At a time when the U.S. space program struggles to capture the American public's imagination and money for its future, it may reach 35 years back into the past for inspiration. Alan Duke, CNN reporting. They started out heroes, astro chimps who rocketed into orbit to see if space travel was safe. 
Nearly four decades later, some 41 chimps used by the Air Force and 103 of their offspring ended up leased to biomedical research labs like this one. Now Congress has passed a law mandating the Air Force give the chimps away. Recipients of the uh, chimpanzees, whoever they may be, uh, must use them for medical research or scientific research or retirement. There is no preference stated in the statute as between one, uh, one use or the other. At a briefing on the giveaway, animal rights groups raising money to care for the chimps were discouraged. This is a, a rather sad, a tragic situation and uh, I guess is representative of the way our government uh, sees chimpanzees simply as property, not as individuals. Also vying for the chimps, the lab now leasing 115 of them, many for AIDS and hepatitis research. But the Colston Foundation has been heavily fined for mistreating its chimps and is currently being investigated for the deaths of several chimps earlier this year. It insists critics haven't visited its facilities lately. So they don't know how we treat the animals. How do you treat the animals? We treat them very well. The average age of the 144 Air Force chimpanzees is 20, and they can live to be 50 or 60. Caring for them costs 15 to 25 dollars a day. Even the Air Force admits no one group may have the money to care for all the chimpanzees. Some believe the Air Force has a duty to at least help pay for the care of the chimps that helped make air and space travel safe for mankind. They should take some responsibility for making sure that uh, the, they, the chimpanzees get what they deserve, that they get a retirement, a sanctuary. They've served people uh, for years, and now they're just being farmed out to another organization. Our desire is to make sure that the chimpanzees continue on in, in their life. The Air Force will decide October 6th whether that life will be lived in a sanctuary or in a laboratory. <coughs> Kathleen Koch for CNN, Washington. By the way, the most famous chimps in U.S. space history were Ham, the first chimpanzee in space, and Enos, who orbited the Earth before John Glenn made his historic space flight in 1962. He's seriously talking with NASA about letting him go up on the space shuttle. Have you heard about this? It's true. NASA says they're interested in seeing how space flights affect aging. Well, John Glenn isn't the only senior astronaut interested in going into space. NASA is also thinking about sending one of their very first astronauts, 76-year-old Larry Decker. Are you familiar? Do you, you know? I'm not Larry Decker, one of very early. Yeah, in fact, yeah. In fact, let's talk to Larry now via satellite at the old astronaut's home, and uh, he is in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Can we can we get a hook up, Larry? Are you there, Larry? Huh? Huh? Are you there? Yeah, says Larry. Uh, okay. Here I am, Jay. Larry, for those of us who who don't know, uh, Larry was the very first astronaut ever, but you never got to go into space. Is no, I didn't, correct? Jay. Now, why, why didn't you go into space? I'm afraid of heights. Afraid of heights. <laughs> now, now, when did NASA first discover this? Ah, uh, when they closed the capsule door, I started screaming like a little schoolgirl. Ah! <coughs> really? It's... Well, it's good to see you're still drinking the Tang. Tang? I'm 76, Jay. This is Metamucil. <laughs> new orange flavor. The new orange flavor. Ah, gritty. Well, let me ask you this, Larry. What? <laughs> What do you like best about being in space? Best? Uh, no question about it. Zero gravity. You know, with zero gravity, I have five times less likelihood of having to break a hip. I see. Now, let me ask you this. Now, if you go back into space at your age, will that be a new record? Uh, you bet. I'll be the first 76-year-old who ever left Florida. Really? Wow. Well, let me... Let me ask you something. When Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, he said those immortal words, one small step for man, one uh, giant leap yeah. for mankind. What, yeah. what would you have said if you had been first? Hey, I probably would have said, hey, don't forget where we parked the car. <laughs> I say that wherever I go. Yeah. <laughs> now, Larry, do you still think your 76-year-old body can, can handle the stress of, of liftoff? Not according to my wife, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if you excuse me, I got to... Boldly go. Go when, boldly go when no man has gone before? No, the Metamucil just kicked you, and I got to, just got to boldly go. Houston, I think we have a problem. <laughs> Larry Decker, ladies and gentlemen.
put on a rerun tonight. <laughs> somber moment, but an appropriate way to start day three of the UN Earth Summit. I have also a sad duty to inform you that Mr. Jacques Cousteau passed away in Paris last night. It is with a sad heart that I say this, uh, re recognizing him as a, one of the giants of our time. The French-born undersea explorer was a champion of the environment, a man whose work serves Monsieur as an environmental Président. example to many of the world leaders at the summit. Jacques-Yves Cousteau, the soft-spoken French oceanographer beloved by millions, has died. The inventor, explorer, and champion of the environment passed away Wednesday at his home in Paris. He was 87 years old. CNN's Jim Bitterman takes a look at the life of this remarkable man. From his exploits, the world knew Jacques Cousteau as an adventurer. But what he really was, was an inventor. He helped create the first aqualung so he could have more freedom underwater. And then he invented a whole new world of underwater exploration. He invented mini subs and underwater living quarters to better study the oceans. And when he found the harm man was doing to them, he created a whole ecological movement to prevent it. He once even invented a fake hippopotamus to study the hippo herds of Africa. He, in fact, invented a unique life. After being injured in an automobile accident, he had to forget his dreams of becoming a pilot and find something else. Swimming for physical therapy brought him to the sea, and a borrowed pair of goggles let him see what was beneath it. But his real vision was of a different sort. He wanted to sail the seas and document it all, and he did it. He wanted to awaken people to the fragility of the planet. And long before anyone else, he was doing it through his documentaries that were shown around the world. His foresight was recognized and admired over and over again. Those who sailed with him remembered that vision and his enthusiasm the most. One said he was always way ahead of everyone else and was planning for the future right up to his very last year. 85, 86 years old, he said to me, Greg, in 10 years we have to do that. I was a little bit uh, surprised, but he was so enthusiastic. Le commandant Cousteau a rejoint le monde du silence. Madame Cousteau told a news conference that her husband had planned well beyond his death, that his work will continue, and that his dream to build a new exploration ship would become a reality. French President Jacques Chirac and numerous other notables from here and around the world are expected to attend a formal memorial mass for Cousteau at the Cathedral of Notre Dame on Monday. He will be buried in France. At her news conference, his widow read a poem he had selected. It read, from earth to earth, all that swim, from earth to earth, all that fly. Fish will carry my crown around my forehead. Birds will speak to the crowds. Jim Bitterman, CNN, Paris. In Florida, as in many other places, any appearance by Jacques Cousteau and his research vessel, the Calypso, drew crowds and cameras. That was in 1986. Ten years ago, Jacques Cousteau brought the Calypso here to Miami to the Merrill Stevens Boatyard for a refitting. The famed boat was moored right back there. Jimmy Merrill remembers Cousteau as a professional who always made time for fans. People drove from all over the country just to stand on the bridge adjacent to the ship to have their picture taken. While he could have bought a new ship, Cousteau insisted on keeping his converted minesweeper, the Calypso. He referred to the Calypso as a lifelong lover. She only gets better as she gets older. Even the youngest students and biologists at the University of Miami Marine Research Lab are inspired by Cousteau. Researcher Amel Said of Tunisia on the northern coast of Africa says Cousteau encouraged her countrymen to explore the deep. He presents things so enthusiastically, and then he's like always like this, this mystery. I, I see him as my role model. Now a high school senior, Eric Medeiros remembers watching Cousteau's documentaries, as well as he remembers Sesame Street. A marine science student, he plans on becoming an oceanographer like Cousteau. Like the way he captured life on camera, it just, it amazed me how like the ocean could have so much life. Two things prompted Peter Swart to become a marine geologist. The 60s TV show Sea Hunt and the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. He actually introduced a whole generation of uh, people to marine science who otherwise would not even have considered it. At the Miami Seaquarium tourist attraction, 
An employee's meeting with Cousteau led to volunteer work with endangered manatee sea cows. I'm trying to make a difference in their lives like he made a difference in so many animals' lives. The best thing that the ocean can bring us is our own survival. If we damage the ocean, it's our own future that we are damaging. Susan Candiotti, CNN, Miami. The U.S. Air Force declared case closed this week on a 1947 incident in which some people believe a spacecraft from another planet crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. In a new report, the Air Force attempts again to debunk the 50-year-old story with evidence that what people saw were secret government experiments, not extraterrestrials. Jamie McIntyre reports from the Pentagon. The Air Force has been saying for years that what a rancher found in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947 was not the wreckage of an alien spacecraft, but the remnants of a kite-like radar target that was attached to a high-altitude balloon as part of Project Mogul, a secret U.S. experiment to try to pick up the sound of Soviet nuclear tests. But the new Air Force report issued on the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident is supposed to close the book on the case. We're confident once the report is out and digested by the public that this will be the final word on the Roswell incident. In the report, the Air Force theorizes that life-size mannequins used in the 50s for high-altitude parachute experiments and ejection seat testing could account for various reports of eyewitnesses seeing alien bodies removed from crash sites. They saw gurneys come out. They saw body bags come out because the dummies were put into body bags to protect them. They saw people in pith helmets. They saw people in shorts out there brushing the bushes looking for the remnants of the balloons. And when you put all that stuff together and spin it, you find that it fits perfectly with many of the, the occurrences in Roswell during that era. What doesn't fit, say UFO believers, is that Roswell was in 1947 and the first dummy test was conducted in 1953. I don't know why they can't associate that time period. I'm sorry, I just don't have any information for that. And those who claim to have seen aliens say they are shorter and have bigger heads and eyes than the Air Force dummies. I don't reconcile that. I just have no idea why they say that. While the Air Force has produced pictures of dozens of balloon payloads that could easily be confused with flying saucers, many critics still think it's all part of a cover-up. The Air Force insists there were no initial reports of alien bodies in Roswell in 1947, that those reports didn't surface until the 70s. As for why it took 50 years to come up with the dummy theory, the Air Force says it was simply the case of an officer doing routine declassification work and putting two and two together. Jamie McIntyre, CNN, the Pentagon. It could be the bargain of a lifetime, more than 700 hectares of land for about 16 U.S. dollars. But before you close the deal, keep in mind that the property is out of this world, literally. CNN's Don Knapp has more on the man who wants to sell you the moon. Good afternoon, the Lunar Embassy. It's a stretch to call this office the Lunar Embassy. Even more of a stretch to call it Lunar Real Estate. But they say they're selling property here, property on the moon. A lunar deed, which specifies the location of your property. Can they do that? Even the American astronauts who went to the moon didn't claim ownership, and a U.N. treaty prohibits countries from owning planets and satellites in the solar system. But is there a loophole? They forgot to mention the word, no individual may have sovereignty or control over them. That's where you come in. So I came in and filed a declaration of ownership, claiming ownership to the moon and the other eight planets and their moons, making me the owner. Tell it to Buzz Aldrin, one of the few in history who's walked on the moon. Aldrin's not buying. Well, if somebody wants to have a certificate that says they own a certain portion of the moon and they're willing to pay whatever it is, probably the only thing they'll ever get is a certificate. The mayor of Rio Vista has one of those certificates. What are you going to do with your property? Oh, I'd, I'd turn it over in a minute if I could find a, a ding -a -ling to buy it from me. <laughs> the owners of an industrial drying process snapped up $42,000 worth of moon lots to give to customers. And they're all good customers who'll buy more dry vac equipment, so they're part of our family now. You know? The lunar family. The lunatics. <laughs> We have T-shirts, coffee cups, mouse pads, water bottles. Dennis yeah. Hope owes his success to an outrageous idea, tremendous public interest, and his Internet site, moonshop.com.
No. Who was it? Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger? Yes. Are you sure? It. Yes. He, he... I authorized his credit card myself. Right now we're doing about 175 to 200 parcels a day. Oh, wow, it's $16 a parcel. Yeah, well, that's on the moon. On Mars, it's $19.99. Lunar sales are bringing in three to $4,000 a day. Is it legal? Sounds like a possible scam to me, but I don't know the facts. I mean, why would anybody want to buy real estate on Mars? Hope says he's sold 11,000 lots on the moon so far, 1,000 lots on Mars. Sales are going so well, in fact, he says, that if the space-exploring countries of the world don't start buying some property from him, they'll all end up as trespassers. Don Knapp, CNN, Rio Vista, California. Astronomers believe that asteroids have been around as long as the planets, and many scientists are convinced that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs millions of years ago. Some evidence that may support that theory went on display on Friday at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. It's a core sample drilled from the ocean floor. Scientists say they believe that it shows the moment in geological time when the asteroid hit. According to the theory, the collision blotted out the sun and killed most plant and animal life. A NASA spacecraft this week made the closest approach ever to an asteroid. The near-Earth Asteroid Rendezvous spacecraft, NEAR for short, passed just 750 miles from the asteroid Matilda on Friday. Matilda is one of thousands of asteroids that orbit the sun between Mars and Jupiter. It's a hunk of black rock the size of Rhode Island, and scientists don't know much about it. They think it may be made of material dating back to the birth of the solar system more than four billion years ago. Skies over the Kennedy Space Center haven't shown signs of it yet, but forecasters say thunderstorms this Tuesday could postpone Space Shuttle Columbia's launch. CNN will have live coverage of Columbia's liftoff whenever it occurs. About a two-hour flight from Ellington Field in Houston. And the C-5 aircraft in the background is the airplane that brought the first space station flight hardware to the Kennedy Space Center last week, the Node 1. Here's the first batch, STS-83, with a quick, re quick reflight. Uh, you can see that we made the second patch just by changing the outer perimeter color and uh, slapping a 94 on the bottom, and we were ready to go fly again. And that's kind of the way that the whole flight was approached. It was a quick, rapid reflight. Let's go around the crew one more, uh, one more time in the uh, suit-up room. Uh, there's Susan uh, checking out her helmet. Uh, this is just before we step out to the uh, Astro Van. Janice Voss is all checked out and uh, waiting for the word to step out to the elevator. Mike Gernhardt, he's ready also. And Don Thomas. Roger there checking out the microphones that uh, provide communication, of course, to the ground. And finally, Greg Linteris. We're surrounded by suit techs. The feeling here is kind of like being in the locker room prior to the big game. Well, it's the big day, and uh, unfortunately, the weather forecasters have given us a 10% chance of a go due to the uh, afternoon thunderstorms that had been happening every afternoon about our lunchtime. So we proceed to the pad with anticipation, hoping that possibly the weathermen are wrong. We get all strapped in, takes about an hour to strap us all in and get us all set ready to go. We have to get our gloves on, our helmet on. And uh, it's, it's challenging getting into the vehicle while it's in the vertical. And we have a couple of people that help us strap in and make sure that everything's put together right. As you see, it starts raining about an hour before launch and we're beginning to think we might not get to go. But lo and behold, the sun shines through and six seconds Prior to liftoff, the main engines come up, the GPCs see good main engines, the SRVs light, and off we go. You can see the vibrations inside at liftoff. It, uh, it appears pretty violent. But that happens pretty rapidly, and then we start feeling the onset of Gs. We go from 1 to 3 Gs in the first couple of minutes of the flight up until the SRB separation point. When the SRBs separate, we can see a flash inside the cockpit and we can also feel it. After the SRBs separate, we go back to 1G and it feels like a huge weight has been lifted off of our chest. 
and then we go slowly back up to 3 G's as we approach main engine cutoff eight and a half minutes later. And for the last two minutes, we're under that high G-forces, feeling like we have elephants sitting on us. So here the elephant finally gets off of our chest, and we're in orbit. He encountered a possible problem with an auxiliary power unit just shortly after takeoff on Tuesday. It left less than two hours ago from the Kennedy Space Center. Now, this problem was a momentary pressure drop with that drop with, uh, with that auxiliary power unit. It was shut down. Now, this particular problem doesn't mean that there is any Zero. problem in terms of them flying or their takeoff, but however, one of these units is needed for the space shuttle to land. It does have three of the units, and this was described as a glitch in a valve in this auxiliary power unit and not a serious problem. With the Microgravity Science Laboratory, a research bridge to the International Space Station. Roger, okay, uh, roll, Columbia. Houston is now controlling. Roll maneuver is uh, complete aboard Columbia. The orbiter is now in a heads down position on course for a 28 and a half degree, 160 nautical mile orbit. Now at 30 seconds, the uh, three engines aboard the orbiter will begin uh, throttling down as the vehicle prepares to pass through the area of the maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Having just passed through that area of maximum dynamic pressure, the three engines are preparing to begin a throttle back up. Die Raumfähre Columbia ist in Cape Canaveral problemlos ins All gestartet. Die Besatzung soll 16 Tage lang Experimente durchführen. Getestet wird auch das europäische Weltraumlabor Spacelab. Up in space, the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia has begun its second attempt at a 16-day science mission. 3, 2, 1... Zero and liftoff of Columbia with a microphone. The shuttle lifted off from Florida's Kennedy Space Center a little more than two hours ago after a short weather delay. The seven member crew will now try to complete the 33 lab experiments it began in April. That mission was cut short by 12 days because of a malfunctioning fuel cell. This mission is also experiencing a power glitch. A valve in a power unit caused a momentary pressure drop. Officials say this is not a serious problem. Ursprünglich geplant hat die US-Raumfähre Columbia den Weltraumflughafen Cape Canaveral in Richtung All verlassen. Sie startete 47 Minuten eher um 19.50 Uhr unserer Zeit. Der Grund waren herannahende Unwetter. Die Meteorologen hatten vor Regen und Sturm gewarnt. Abgesehen von der Terminänderung verlief der Start der Raumfähre ohne Schwierigkeiten. Die sieben Astronauten, sechs Männer und eine Frau, setzten eine Mission fort, die sie im April wegen technischer Pannen abgebrochen hatten. Columbia is back in orbit. The launch went off as scheduled Tuesday with seven crew members aboard. They were trying to perform scientific experiments that couldn't be completed in April because of equipment problems. Troubles continue aboard Russia's Mir space station. The three crew members are being forced to get their oxygen from air canisters until a new generator can go online. This is just the latest setback since a supply ship collided with Mir during a test docking last week. And in other news around outer space, the Mars Pathfinder is closing in on the red planet. CNN will bring you extensive coverage of the landing beginning on Friday. Well, as ships from planet Earth probe ever deeper into space, there are those who believe we have played host to extraterrestrials. For half a century now, the UFO faithful have been flocking to a small town in the southwestern United States. CNN's Greg Lamont tries to separate fact from fiction in Roswell, New Mexico. Look up in the air. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a flying saucer. It must be. The newspaper said so 50 years ago. And it said the alien ship was captured. There were five alien bodies. They were have been described as being about uh, four and a half to five and a half feet tall. The skin was very ashen colored. 
Um, the head was slightly larger than a head on a human body. And thus was born the legend of Roswell, New Mexico. For 50 years, people have talked about what has become known as the Roswell Incident. In 1947, the Air Force issued a press release saying it had recovered a flying disc. The next day, it was amended to say it was a balloon. Whatever it was, today, 50 years later, if you're into UFOs and extraterrestrials, Roswell is the place to be. And there's lots of evidence here that shows that maybe something happened out there, but uh, we just came because it's the 50th anniversary. A giant UFO celebration is underway this week, marking the alleged incident. This rancher takes people on tours of the alleged crash site. There are two museums dedicated to UFOs, and Roswell is definitely decked out in alien. Fact is, some people claim to have witnessed the crash. Over the years, there have been eerie stories of alleged secret military autopsies and photos purporting to show them. And there have been several descriptions of what the alleged alien craft looked like. But look at this. This was filmed shot by the Air Force back in the 1950s. Can you imagine what you would think if you saw something like this? Actually, these were tests involving listening devices, and there were other tests that involved dropping dummies from flying aircraft. Fifty years after the fact, the Air Force conducted its own investigation into the Roswell incident, and last week said people were understandably mistaken by the testing going on. But not everyone is buying the Air Force explanation. At least they're sticking to their story, <laughs> even if nobody else believes them. I feel this is a very, very important event. I think it's part of a government conspiracy, as do most people. I think some things may have been exaggerated, but uh, I think uh, I believe in UFOs. And 50 years later, Roswell is learning where there's belief, there's bucks. Greg Lamont, CNN, reporting. Zero and lift off für die Raumfähre Columbia. Wegen schlechten Wetters in Cape Canaveral war der Start der amerikanischen Raumfähre bis zuletzt gefährdet. Während ihres 16-tägigen Fluges führen die sieben Astronauten an Bord zahlreiche wissenschaftliche Experimente durch, darunter auch eines für die deutsche Forschung. Mit diesem Flug wird eine Mission von April fortgesetzt, die wegen technischer Probleme vorzeitig abgebrochen werden musste. A new CNN USA Today Gallup poll suggests almost one third of Americans believe an alien spacecraft crash landed at Roswell, New Mexico around this time in 1947. They believe, despite the lack of definitive proof and despite a report issued last week by the US Air Force debunking the Roswell myth, but UFOs have become a cottage industry with web pages, conventions, and networks. And Roswell is the high temple for UFO true believers. The town expects 100,000 people and $5 million to pour in this week. We're joining us from Roswell now is Dion Crosby, director of the International UFO Museum there. Dion Crosby, what do you believe happened in Roswell 50 years ago? We really believe that a spacecraft from another world crashed north of Roswell. The military had already an orchestrated plan to, to gather all the information up, to cover it up, to keep it away from civilians. And they were very successful in that. And you believe that aliens landed? I do believe that they crash landed. Um, there were reports of four bodies. One of them lived for a short time. Some actually believe that maybe he's still alive. We don't know that for sure. But yes, something extraordinary happened in 1947. Why do you think the government, as you say, has been covering this up? They were denying it again only last week in that report. There are a lot of of ideas as to why and theories as to why the government covers it up, but we don't know for sure. Um, they admit that nothing ever happened, although they continued to put reports out explaining away what didn't exist. Now, one of their explanations is that these, what you say were aliens, were in fact parachute dummies. That's believable, isn't it, too? Or is that it's not, not credible? Really, well, it's not credible because we have the logs of the balloons that the military actually um, sent into the air in this area during that time. If you're testing something, then you would make records and notes on those logs. And none of those blogs have any notations of any type of dummies or anything attached to them. So now it is the 50th anniversary. There are about 100,000 people gathering there. How are you all going to celebrate? 
We are going to have a wonderful party, a grand party, and the world is coming to this party. Um, we started off yesterday with a classic UFO film festival featuring many of the 1950s films. They haven't been seen in decades on a big screen, so this is a big feature. Everything from costume contests to flying saucer pancake eating contests, and then the serious we address also. You mentioned Derek Von Donneken. He is in Roswell as one of our lecturers this week. So how many of the people there do you think are there because they're true believers, and how many are there because it seems like fun? I think it's probably half and half. Um, we don't know. We don't screen people at the doors of the museum. We don't screen people outside. Uh, a lot of people are seeing that this is the place to be this summer. There's going to be a lot of fun. And so they're coming in, dro in droves. Dion Crosby from Roswell, New Mexico. Thanks for being with us. One of the first things we have to do to get ready for payload operations is open the payload bay doors. That inner surface is a radiator that allows us to get rid of waste heat so we can turn all the experiments on without getting the orbiter too hot. Once we get the doors open, then we're ready to go activate the space lab module. You saw it there briefly in the payload bay. This is it from the inside. That's me coming into the module. Roger will be coming in right behind me. We get all the equipment powered up in the subsystems. We turn on the lights, turn on the communication system, get the water loop running, get all that equipment ready so we can run experiment operations. Crew is always anxious, especially in the first few days, to see how the experiments are going to do. We had a mob here collected around one of the combustion experiments to see how the early runs would go. And sure enough, the run went really well. One of the uh, big areas of research was combustion. And right here, I'm trying to adjust the flame height for one of the experiments. The purpose was to find the point at which soot was just forming. There's the igniter. The flame is actually going to be pointing down in this image. Here the fuel is coming out and it's lighting. You can see it's making a lot more soot than expected. And so we had to quickly adjust the flow rate down. The purpose of this experiment is to understand soot formation so we can make devices on Earth that make less soot and pollute less. Another experiment that we had, uh, here's the uh, laser extinction view of that same flame. The dark areas correspond to high soot concentration. And this was very unexpected. We didn't expect that much soot. Another experiment was to study very, very lean combustion, as would be important for lean burning engines. These were some of the weakest flames ever burnt anywhere. And uh, they were in dilute hydrogen oxygen mixtures. Both of these ex experiments were very, very successful. Our third major combustion experiment was a droplet combustion experiment. We formed it was essentially gasoline to little droplets and burned it so you could study how the fuels burn in, as in a droplet of flame in a fire. We had several different ways of looking at the flame once the droplet's been formed. You see it there forming between the two needles. It's deployed, ignited. On the left view is a visible light. On the right view is ultraviolet. You can see how you can get different science from the two different views of the flame. An important concept we wanted to demonstrate on this flight was the ability to transfer experiments, say, from the mid-deck of the uh, space shuttle to a space station, which is something we'll be doing in the future. Here we had a, uh, an experiment called Astro PGBA, a uh, small greenhouse. We launched it in the uh, mid-deck of the shuttle, and on about day two, Susan and I transferred it back to the space lab. We unpowered it, unhooked it, and took it back there and bolted it into our space lab module into a, a rack called the Express Rack which will be flying in the future on space station to accommodate these types of experiments. And our goal was just to practice this transfer to see how it would work on orbit, and it did a great job. And then later on the mission, uh, right before we came home, we transferred it back to the mid-deck again. We had another experiment on board looking at transfer operations. This is the combustion that you just heard about. And I'm taking out the one that had the soot production, and we're going to put in the one with the weak flames. This is another space station concept that would allow you to develop new experiments as the space station ages. You could remove one set of equipment and bring up from the ground a new set that's been designed for the new experiment. Besides the combustion work, we had a number of material science experiments. I'm working at a facility here called the Large Isothermal Furnace. This is a, a Japanese facility. 
one of the two international partners we had on board. Uh, I'm putting a new sample into the chamber here, and it's a highly automated facility. This is one of the German facilities called Tempest. It's electromagnetic levitation furnace, and you can see the, the round sphere on the right is a small molten material. Uh, it's heated up and spinning around and bouncing around there as we process it. A couple of the uh, secondary payloads that I had the opportunity to participate on. Here's one uh, handheld diffusion uh, unit. We actually grew protein crystals in here, hopefully, which might lend to the development of some new drugs having to do with the, uh, easing the effects of asthma or antibacterial drugs. Uh, diabetes is another area of interest. We also grew several varieties of plants. Of course, if we ever uh, expect to spend a long time in space, and we do, we need to learn how to do that in zero gravity. A nice little workstation called the glove box provides power and cooling for different experiments that are relatively small, usually a complement of some of the other experiments on board. This particular one is a complement to the droplet combustion that Janice talked about. You can see in the center of the screen there two little round ball looking things. Those are little droplets of fuel. It's the first time that they've, anyone's ever ignited two, two uh, flame balls simultaneously like this. They were able to get a correlation between the larger facility and this facility so that uh, we were able to run 60 or 70 runs here. Other experiments that we did in this area had to do with some containerless processing using ultrasonic uh, waves. We also had some uh, capillary heater or heat transfer tubes that heat transfer differently in space using a mechanism called heat pipe. They've been failing in the past and we were able to observe a failure mechanism to possibly help uh, alleviate some problems they've had before. We got into a nice routine over the 16-day flight, and typically that routine started out with getting a fax from the ground on the tips. <clears throat> this is me uh, doing an IMU align where we mark on some nav stars and update our IMUs. The other thing we had to do is get messages up on the computers, and that's Susan uh, dealing with the daily uplink messages. And, uh, Typically, little things can go wrong. We had almost a flawless mission. Uh, this is Roger and I doing an IFM where we had to rewire a thermocouple connector on the LIF furnace. And uh, the ground researched it and faxed us up a procedure, and it worked just fine. This is Jim on the SARX radio, the, the amateur uh, radio experiment, talking to some school kids around the world. That was a lot of fun for us, and they sure did a good job on that. Here's Janice uh, hanging like a bat from the mid-deck escape pole working on the computer, and we tried to position the computer such that there wouldn't be traffic jams, and sticking it on the roof was a good place to do that. This is the red shift going to sleep, trying to do formation flying. There's Jim kind of messing up there, but... <laughs> and these are the, these are the uh, sleep stations. You can see them closing the door. We've got little straps that we use to, to hold us down, but typically your back hurts if you try to strap yourself in, so some of us would free float in the sleep station, but the problem was you'd wake up and it'd be pitch black and you wouldn't know where the door was. <laughs> Here's Greg washing his hair with the famous rinseless shampoo that accumulates over 16 days. <laughs> it's kind of like a uh, camping trip with seven people and of course there's only one bathroom so everybody has to wait in line and uh, there you see Jim brushing his teeth while Janice changes her clothes to get ready to go exercise. Exercise was a real par uh, important part of our daily operations. We carry pretty much the same personal hygiene uh, items that you would use on the ground. There's Greg shaving, and here's Don exercising on the ergometer. Off to the left there, you see the uh, valuable duct tape and Susan's Fruit Loops. That must have been early in the flight. <laughs> we also had these Dyna bands, and here's Susan doing a little leg workout. And there's me getting ready to cook some spaghetti. Uh, the food was great. Uh, we all ate very healthily, and, and uh, no one really lost too much weight. There's Janice eating some of her uh, famous bird seed. <laughs> and Roz, you're sneaking a, a bite back in the lab. While Pathfinder is checking out Mars, U.S. astronauts aboard the shuttle Columbia are conducting experiments that may one day aid manned flights to the red planet. Specifically, the astronauts are constructing a mini greenhouse that will allow them to see how various plants grow in space. Future travelers, for example, to Mars would likely need to grow their own food. The astronauts are also conducting tests with fire. They want to see how flames spread in weightlessness. 
about it. <laughs> Jim Hulsehouse, John Holloman at CNN, along with Riz Khan at CNN International. We've got a, a huge audience for you guys today all over the world in uh, about 210 countries or looking in. They have uh, emailed us some questions. Some people have called in on the phone with questions. The first question, though, I'd like to ask you is from uh, Donna Shirley, who's the manager of NASA's Mars Pathfinder project. She's joining us here. She wants to know if all of you would like to go to Mars if you got the opportunity. How about it? I'll pass the mic around, but speaking for myself, I'll sign up for the program any day they, uh, they uh, pass that sign up sheet around. <laughs> Can't be that bad up there if they want to go that far. <laughs> yep, I'll go too. As a young boy, I always wanted to uh, have a chance to go to the moon and to have a potential opportunity to go to Mars would be even a, a quantum leap above that, so I'd go in a second. <laughs> How about it, Roger? Last man in line up there. What else can I say, eh? <laughs> Well, if the shuttle could make it, you probably uh, would get there uh, without a lot of trouble. One thing you can't do, and one thing that a lot of our viewers are calling in and wanting to know about, you can't get to the Russian space station Mir. Uh, a couple of days ago, you were about 60 miles away. You were able to look at them. Uh, tomorrow, about uh, probably uh, 20 hours uh, from now, you'll get 75 miles away from Mir. Uh, Riz, we had a question from a viewer in Germany about That's this. That's right. Yes, if you could put that to them, please. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not far from the damaged space station. It must be very bad feeling that you all are not able to help them. Is there, is there any way, um, and let me uh, give this to Jim Hulsell, is there any way you could help them if the problems on Mir got worse? Actually, uh, from our given orbit, we cannot get to the Mir. It's in a higher inclination orbit that we simply don't have the, uh, the fuel to reach at this point. Uh, uh, we did have the opportunity, as you mentioned, to see Mir a few days ago, and actually I did not, but Susan did, so let me, uh, let me pass it off to her and let you, let you hear it from her. Yeah, actually Don and I saw Mir the other night, and it was spectacular. Mir was the brightest thing in the sky, and she just passed almost directly overhead of us, and almost close enough to reach out and touch them, and yes, of course we wish we could go help them. Unfortunately, Columbia can't get to that inclination. All right, here's a viewer question from Robert in England who uh, called in moments ago, and he wants to know what the most spectacular thing you have seen so far on this mission is. Might be something in your space lab, might be something out the window. Um, you can, um, how about it, Roger Crouch? Uh, could you take this, the most spectacular thing you have seen so far on this mission? We've got a bunch of people offering up opportunities. I'll go first. The, uh, I think the most spectacular thing I've seen on this mission compared to my previous flights are dust storms. There's a tremendous amount of dust blowing off the African continent right now, and it's headed uh, toward the west, toward North and South America. And to be able to see those plumes of dust reach out those thousands of miles and know that it's actually what's happening in Africa is right now impacting the weather in Atlanta and all across the United States, it, it's an interesting and a privileged no kidding, Jim. And we have a lot of viewers in Africa who are uh, probably watching this and looking out the window and saying they can see our dust storm, too. <laughs> Pretty fascinating. John, we get a lot of uh, questions from literally everywhere around the world. Um, and we had, uh, we had one that came from Holland, as you can see there. All right. Okay. This is a good question. I, I, let me ask Susan Still this question, if I may. How do you prepare yourself psychologically and physically for a trip into space? for me. I mean, I was flying fighter jets in the Navy before this, and I've been on and off of aircraft carriers, and, and so it's uh, kind of natural for me to take this step into space. Uh, as far as physically, all the astronauts try and stay physically fit before they go into the mission, because they're not going to get any more physically fit once they're up here. And uh, we do ride the bicycle every day up here to keep our cardiovascular system working fine so that once we get on the ground, it won't be quite so hard to readapt to 1G. Yeah, all right. Um, Riz, I think we got another question. Another one yet from the United Kingdom. Oh, this is from uh, Neville Kidger. All right, uh, folks, um, this is from a viewer who... Uh, tell me who's doing the most work on the, uh, um, on the fire experiments, the fire in space. This is a question specific to that. You can just pass the microphone over to the fire in space expert. Um, and the question is, why 
are your experiments on fire in the combustion module so important during this mission? And what applications can these experiments have for those of us who probably will never get to fly in space, but who uh, have a lot of experience with fire down here on Earth? Uh, Janice, you want to add anything to that as payload commander and an expert on all these experiments? I'd like to ask you, uh, Janice Voss, what, um, what the most interesting of all these experiments in the space lab, uh, which one is at the top of your list? Well, that's not a very fair question to a ask because, of course, they're all special, and that's really true. On, on the first day we did the laminar spent one of the combustion experiments, and it was so cool. We had Roger... Um, yeah, Roger and uh, Greg and Jim and me, all three of us hanging at all different angles watching this experiment go by. And that was great on flight, on our second, my second flight day, flight day three, we had the drop of combustion experiment. And the first two drops got flung off as they were trying some different techniques. And the third one was a beautiful burn, and that was exciting on that day. And I can't wait to see what great experiments we're going to run today. John, John I'm going to, yes, I'm going to bring back in Donna Shirley, who's the uh, Pathfinder project manager. She's joining us from Pasadena, California. And uh, Donna, I know you can't speak directly to the astronauts, but John can relay your question to them. Do you have another brief question for them up in space there? Uh, just that uh, I wanted to tell them that uh, we're working on getting them the information so that they can okay. go to Mars. Well, they're working on information uh, at NASA there so they can go to Mars. That you might want to pass that on. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, they said in answer to your question about everybody wanting to go to Mars, astronaut uh, colleagues, um, they're working on it at JPL. They're trying to pave the way for you. So that's probably pretty good news on this American Independence Day. Another quick question. Um, this is for Jim Hulsell, I think. Jim, um, in a pre-flight briefing, you said that uh, the fact that your first mission was cut so short and the fact that you got to spend a couple of months back here on Earth got uh, allowed the scientists who prepared all these experiments to make some modifications and improvements and make them even better this time. Oliver Kloss in Germany wants to know what sorts of improvements have been made to the experiments. I better pass that off to uh, one of our payload experts here. Let me pass it off to Don. We basically modified some of the parameters uh, based on what we learned the, the first go around uh, on Tempest, one of our uh, electromagnetic levitation furnaces that comes from uh, Germany and the German Space Agency. We've modified the parameters that we use to levitate our samples. Uh, we're using the same materials, the same metals uh, to process. But we've changed the parameters slightly based on what we learned uh, on STS-83. Okay, this question for Roger Crouch, I think. Uh, a viewer, uh, Christopher in Brazil, wants to know, Roger, if it is difficult for a regular person to become an astronaut. I, I, I know a lot about your background, and uh, you're a, you know, a, a brilliant scientist and all that, but in real life you're a regular person, and there you are sitting on the space shuttle. Uh, how tough was it for you to get to the point where you could take uh, your second trip of a lifetime in four months? Well, it's pretty easy to get up here once, they, once you get selected. It's the getting selected part that takes a lot of luck and a lot of hard work and a lot of patience, I think. Uh, as far as being on orbit, the first day or two takes a little bit of adjustment, and then after that it's just the most wonderful feeling you can imagine, even for an average Joe like me. <laughs> Roger, before, uh, before you pass the microphone, I've got to ask you about the space sickness thing. Everybody talks about it. They, uh, uh, what actually, what does it feel like to get space sick? I mean, are you throwing up or you just have headaches? Or, or what, what happened to you uh, on your first flight and what, was it any different on your second flight? Well, a lot of different people have a lot of different symptoms. And normally it's not the actual nausea that gets you. It's, it's sort of a feeling that uh, the first time I was up here, I felt like a balloon that was being pulled down underwater, and sort of like the top part of me was had more pressure on it than the rest of my body, and that was kind of a strange feeling. You have a sort of a feeling of fullness, like if you lay down after you eat for the first day or two. The adaptation between the first mission and this mission has been really incredible for me because. 
because this one was so much easier than the first time. Well, I'm glad everybody's surviving. Anybody else have any uh, any bad trouble uh, with adaptation syndrome, as uh, as the nasty speak is, or did most of you guys just kind of zoom through this? Yeah, I think the, the the real data point on this whole flight is if you let a crew fly three months apart, the second time around, the adaptation is is very quick, uh, almost painless, I would call it. And I think that'll be a medical uh, point of interest for all the doctors back home because they, they've never really had uh, this number of people refly this quickly before, and I, and I know they're going to be interested in that. Uh, my interest now will be on landing to see if uh, what held true on coming into orbit also holds true on landing. That is, our readaptation to 1G is just as quick. Yeah. So, Jim, if, if NASA said, we'll let you guys go back up in October, same crew, and refly these experiments, uh, you and your crew would have no problem with that, right? I see a lot of shaking heads. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> we've had, had a lot of questions, facts to us, Riz. Yes. Uh, well, actually, John, I was wondering about the workload up on this trip with them. That's right. Is, you guys are working 24 hours a day. Uh, how hard is the work? We're just pleased you got a few minutes to share with us. But, I mean, when you're not sitting around, you know, floating around doing TV interviews, how busy is your, is your workload? Yeah, Janice, you're the uh, you're the commander. Very hard on the ground. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. We work very hard on the ground to try to maximize the amount of science without overworking the crew, so you don't get tired people that will make mistakes. They very carefully plan the mission, both for power levels and crew time, to try to keep a pretty constant level of work. And they've been doing a superb job. I would say they hit it just almost exactly right. We're working pretty continuously on the entire spectrum of experiments, and the handovers come at good times where we can break and and not have any crew-operated experiments going on, and yet we're getting all the science done. So I would say the workload is just about perfect. All right, we've got uh, less than a minute of satellite time left. It is Independence Day in the United States, and this interview is being broadcast live to every country but the United States, but it'll be broadcast to the United States on tape a little later. Any words for the people of the world or uh, your home country as you uh, float around uh, 160 miles above us? <laughs> Well, certainly, we, uh, uh, we're celebrating a very special day up here, as everybody in the United States is, and it's the 4th of July, and we, and we feel very privileged to have the opportunity to celebrate that very important holiday up here in space. Uh, and we'd like to point out that there are a lot of Americans all over the world, I'm sure many watching this broadcast right now, serving their country in a number of different ways, uh, from the military service to the foreign service to businesses spread far and wide across this world. And uh, I think I'd like to, in real time, repeat something that we tried yesterday. Okay, I see some nods here. On behalf of all Americans everywhere. Happy birthday, America! <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, crew of Columbia, thank you very much. We were just so excited to see all of you, uh, in, in, instead of just a couple uh, that we'd been told we'd get. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day. We're thinking about you here, and uh, I'm trying to keep the folks on the ground uh, as up-to-date as I can amidst the other space stories uh, about how successful your experiments and your mission has been so far. We'll see you when you get back about the 17th, I guess. Um, uh, happy flight, safe, safe time up there. John, and thanks to you very much for putting our viewer questions from around the and world. And our viewers. Jeez, yeah. Our viewers have much better questions than I do. Uh, thank <laughs> we'll all of you for, uh, for checking in with these excellent questions. <laughs>
uh, some of this story back home with them. They are all manner of uh, oh, all sorts of interesting things to look at and take with you. Uh, everything from UFO keychains and uh, oh, earrings, and there's a, even a UFO clock. This is, by the way, the, the shape of this clock. This is what the uh, creatures that were sighted here 50 years ago were purported to look like. So sort of an interesting uh, melange of things here. A lot of people interested in what goes on. Uh, people from all over the world have come to uh, drink it in here. And I don't know, are you a believer, sir, yes or no? Uh, I don't know. Don't know. Evidence isn't all in, but I can't believe we're the only things alive out, you know, out and about. Okay, that seems to be a common thread that whether or not there were particular UFOs here 50 or, or particular aliens here 50 years ago, that in fact something's out there. What do you think, ma'am? I really don't know. I was here at the time, but they hushed it up, so I really didn't give it much thought. You didn't see anything? No, no. Uh, what do you make of all of the people here in your town? Oh, it's just wonderful. We are friendly people. We're glad to have visitors. What about you, sir? Believer or no? Uh, Non-believer. 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 So why are you here? Um, because I think something actually happened, and somebody's covering up. And somebody's covering it up. Yep. That seems to be a common thread, Judy, that runs through here. Whether or not people believe that, in fact, aliens were crawling through Roswell 50 years ago, that something happened here, and the U.S. government doesn't want anybody to know what it was. We'll continue to watch it. That's the latest. Back to you. All right, Jeff Flock in New Mexico. Thank you, Jeff. Hillary? In the course of human events, when it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate And that's World News for now. I'm Elisa Vasilova. We'll have more World News in 30 minutes. And just minutes from now, we're expecting to get the first pictures from the Pathfinder probe on Mars. Stay tuned for that. We'll leave you with patriotic wake-up music and some pretty pictures that came from the U.S. Space Shuttle. Thanks for watching. While most scientists scoff at stories of space aliens crash landing at Roswell, New Mexico, several widely respected scientific projects attempt to make radio contact with intelligent life on other planets. We think that the extraterrestrials are out there. In fact, personally, I think that the galaxy probably has a lot of intelligent uh, critters out there, and we're trying to find them by eavesdropping on their radio traffic. Actor Charlie Sheen's movie excitement at the discovery of an alien radio signal may have just about equaled the real-life excitement of scientist Jerry Amon 20 years ago. That's when Amon discovered the Big Wow, a powerful signal captured by Ohio State University's Big Ear radio antenna. It fits what we call our antenna pattern uh, to an extremely high degree, and that could only come about basically from a source uh, very distant certainly beyond the moon. Was it an alien contact? No one knows, but about a dozen other scientific searches continue. What may be the most ambitious is the privately funded SETI Institute Phoenix Search. SETI for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. If there are two or three places in our solar system that have life, life is rampant. Life is not a miracle. It's a statistic. It's something that happens all the time. So if you're getting a lot of life cooked up in the galaxy, maybe some of it's smart enough to build a radio transmitter. While Seth Shostak searches for alien radio broadcasts, he doesn't ever expect to have a personal encounter. It's a matter of distance and the laws of physics. 
If you want to make that trip in 10 years or less, the amount of energy your rocket's going to burn up is the amount of energy that the United States uses in a century. So they may well be out there, and someday we may even have an interplanetary chat. But forget that close encounter, arrival, and contact stuff. Shostak says it's just not fuel efficient. Don Knapp, CNN, Mountain View, California. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of... Columbia roared into space on Tuesday for a 16-day space mission. It's a reflight of an April mission that had to be cut short because of problems with a power generator. The astronauts are studying fire and how flames spread in the near-zero gravity of space. They're also doing a variety of other experiments with an eye to a future when people spend long periods of time in space. After the reported crash of an alien spacecraft on a ranch near the town, the government first confirmed, then denied that story. Recently, the Air Force said it dropped mannequins from a high-altitude balloon. And that's a look at our top stories. Now back to Frank Sesno in Washington with CNN Late Edition. Frank. Thanks very much, Kathleen. You could say we're on message here. You could also say and call it a cosmic weekend. Not only Roswell, but also Mars, Mir, and the Space Shuttle. An earthly anniversary. It seems the world is looking to the sky. Yesterday, a Russian progress resupply ship blasted off for the space station Mir, scheduled to dock with the damaged station, home to two cosmonauts and one U.S. astronaut. About 13 hours from now, the Mir collided, you'll recall, with a cargo ship back on June 25th, killing at least half its power supply. Meanwhile, the space shuttle Columbia is orbiting the Earth, its crew conducting scientific experiments in the onboard space laboratory. And now, the Mars mission, 21 years after Viking landed on the red planet, extraordinary new pictures, beamed back by the Pathfinder, and now a robot rover preparing to explore Mars' rocky terrain. What will we learn? Well, a short time ago, we spoke with the man who oversees America's space program, NASA Administrator Daniel Golden. Here he is. Mr. Golden, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, an Frank. An exciting day. You know, a day that uh, confronts many people as they open up their newspapers, their Sunday papers, with banner headlines on spectacular pictures from Mars. We've got some of them that we're going to see here. There were initial communications problems uh, with the rover. Those appear to have been solved. What's the payoff here? What do we get out of all this? Well, the payoff is we are now opening the second generation of exploration of our solar system, and we're doing it a very different way. We're doing it for a lot less money in a lot shorter time with unbelievable science returns. But we're going to, over the next decade, we'll be rewriting chemistry and physics and biology textbooks. This is the stuff that's necessary to have America lead the world in the 21st century. We'll begin to understand, are we alone? Did life start on Earth? or did it start other places? We'll be developing design tools that will impact the auto industry, the computer industry, the communications industry. But most important, we're going to stir the hearts of our young people so that they could reach for more in life and have a fuller life. Mr. Golden, some of these pictures we've been seeing here are of the rover. There's one of them just now, as well as the landscape. There we see the landscape, a little arrow pointing to the boulder. First to the rover. Are the communications problems uh, resolved to the extent that this thing is going to be able to maneuver and move as ordered? We believe that that's going to happen. There are a few more glitches, but then again, when you go to the space frontier, you develop problems, and I have such a tremendous pride in those brilliant young people. At what, the are the, what, are the, what are the glitches? You say there are a few more glitches. What's, what's still out there? Well, they want to make sure that, uh, you know, if you have a problem and just fix it once, you have to make sure it doesn't reoccur. Right now, it's working just fine, but I've learned in space, expect the unexpected, and then you uh, deal with it. All right, what's the single most surprising thing you've seen from the Martian landscape so far? The hills. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are two hills. They're like saddle peaks. Uh, they are very, very interesting geological fe features. And in the distance, there's a, a, another hill that we picked up that we think is as high as 450 meters. That's roughly 1,000 feet. So what? Well, it'll help us better understand how the geology on Mars formed. The place that we landed is a floodplain, and it had more water than in all the Great Lakes flow in what we think was only a, a, a short period on the order of a few weeks. That is a tremendous flood. You mentioned at the outset life, the question of life, where it began. This mission isn't going to answer that, but what clues might it give you as to whether there was, or maybe still is, some kind of life, maybe even microscopic life, on Mars? 
Well, this mission is going to help us understand uh, where water was and how it flowed. On Earth, wherever you find water, you find life, where you have an energy source either from the sun or from thermal vents under the ocean. So understanding water and where it is and where it was really helps us. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the rocks to see if it's possible to detect sedimentary rocks. That's another indication, and inside sedimentary rocks could be the clues of life. We won't find it on this mission, but it'll help us plan the next in the series of 10 missions to Mars. Let me play skunk at the garden party for just a minute here. There are terrific pictures, no question. But in the end, and I was reading a piece this morning that suggested, in the end, it's just, they're just a pile of rocks. They're dust and rocks, and so what? Want to take that one on? I'd be pleased to do that. Uh, it may be a pile of rocks to some, but to a geologist, it has the history of a platen hidden in it. You know, on Earth, uh, there is a crustal motion, and there's a very large atmospheric motion, which destroys the, his the history in the rocks. On Mars, we don't the rocks weren't recycled, and there isn't as violent an atmosphere, so we could find rocks on Mars, we believe, much older than the rocks on Earth, which will help us better understand how Mars and Earth formed and better understand the forces on our own planet. Mr. Golden, to a mission now that's not doing so well, the Mir space station, more trouble this weekend. Our John Holloman reported that sometime after the hatch was sealed on Spectre, after the collision, the cosmonauts heard, heard what sounded like an explosion. Others describe it as a thump. Now, your Frank Culbertson says that uh, it could have been a radiator or some of the experiments that had been taking place in there uh, exploding or popping or doing some such. A, what do you know about it? B, how dangerous is it for the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard? Right now, we don't have uh, much information about what it is. Uh, we don't believe that it is a serious problem, but we're going to analyze it, try and understand it, and uh, make sure that there isn't a safety problem, because safety is the most important issue on board that station. You are still planning to send American astronaut Wendy Lawrence up there on se in, in early September. With all the damage, with 40% power being what's moving this thing right now, why? Why take the risk? Well, let me not say that we're planning on sending her. We have uh, three teams that are looking at it. There are two aspects to sending astronauts up to the Mir space station. First, is it safe? And secondly, is there a scientific and technical reason for doing what that? What are your plans for Wendy Lawrence right now? We will not know until the teams uh, thoroughly evaluate it and report back and make a recommendation. And that recommendation will be well before the time for Wendy to be launched. But there is no commitment to send Wendy up unless we believe it's safe and productive. Do you believe it's if things don't change, if this can't be repaired, is it safe and productive as it now stands? At the present time, we believe it is safe. We've had a team of experts looking at it. I also might want to point out that if at any point in time the astronauts themselves feel it's unsafe, without asking for permission from the ground, they could get into the Soyuz capsule and come back. On top of that, our people are working to assure that it has a level of safety that we think is uh, okay. But uh, productive. we will n productive. productive. Well, right now, uh, it cannot be productive because we have to get the Mir space station back into shape. But we will be looking at this, and we will not send Wendy up unless it's appropriate. So if it's not made productive, if the repairs aren't made, she doesn't go? We, we must have a productive set of data, because just sending someone to sit on the Mir station would not be appropriate. A couple of years ago on this program, the late Carl Sagan said that uh, took NASA to task, as he'd been doing, for spending billions and billions on manned flight as opposed to more versatile, less costly, less risky, unmanned, purely scientific missions. We just saw pictures from Mir. We also have pictures, one of them we have to say is a spectacular picture of the space shuttle Columbia, which is up now. This picture which we're showing shows the sunrise over, uh, over the Earth there. It is an amazing picture, but the question of the cost and the risk remains. How do you respond? Well, let me tell you, we want to use the right uh, and appropriate tools. At some point in time, it's necessary to use robots because you have to get ready for using people. But people are adaptive. People are dexterous. You know, we don't have robots doing research on the ground. In gravity, we do, uh, in space, we do research in the absence of gravity. And there is a tremendous need to use astronauts. We're doing fundamental experiments in biotech and biomed. On the shuttle Columbia, 
we're un trying to understand combustion. America spends a half trillion dollars a year in combustion. We're looking for ways to get more improved combustion efficiency. One or two percent improvement in combustion efficiency can impact the nation. Making less pollution will uh, impact the nation. Daniel Golden, let me uh, lump two questions here together very quickly in the last uh, 30 seconds or so we have left. One is, when do men go to Mars? And B, do you have any question in your mind that some other creatures came to Roswell, New Mexico 50 years ago? <laughs> First, let me say, men won't go to Mars. Women? People will go to Mars. Women? Men and women. Oh, absolutely. We have 30 female astronauts in our astronaut corps. We will send people to Mars when it's scientifically appropriate, when we could figure out how to do it, for a reasonable amount of money because there are other problems inside the nation when it's safe to go because the International Space Station... When could you go? When could you go? If all the money were there, if the will were there, when could you go? I would say that uh, the uh, first decade of the next century might be possible. Okay. But we, can, we, we at NASA are going to help America open up the 21st century and change life for our children. Okay, and yes or no, strange beings in Roswell 50 years ago? I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for sharing some of what you do know. We appreciate your time very much today, Daniel Golden. Congratulations on a spectacular mission on Mars. CNN USA Today Gallup poll shows that when we ask people, do you believe the Air Force explanation in the Roswell case, that these were dummies, crash dummies and balloons for testing nuclear uh, explosions, 25% said yes, 64% said they don't believe the Air Force about Roswell just gets to show that 64% can be wrong. You believe the Air Force? Sure. <laughs> we weren't sure. visited by UFOs and... I think some things we don't know. We don't know when we'll land on Mars or whatever. But we do know what happened in Roswell, and I feel pretty comfortable with it. For a tape or transcript of this and many other CNN programs, call 1-800-CNN-NEWS. Transcripts also available online from LexisNexis. Meanwhile, Columbia's crew is concentrating on sports, in a manner of speaking. On day six of its 16th day mission, the crew tested metals and metal alloys. The findings may help researchers on Earth develop stronger metallic glass products. That could lead to the strengthening of some sporting goods items, such as golf club shafts. Stronger metallic glasses could also be used in future computer products and at processing plants. Back on the ground, one famous astronaut turned politician says, all kinds of things happen to your body when you're in space. And he thinks NASA could learn a thing or two by putting him back in orbit. What you're dealing with is what turns these systems on and off in the human body. If you send an older person back up into space then, would this same kind of change that occurs in younger astronauts be additive, or would I be immune to that, or some older person be immune to that sort of thing? Would we readapt when he came back? What turns the body on and off in as far as protecting itself against osteoporosis and against immune system deficiencies and uh, things like that. Uh, orthostatic tolerance, which is the ability of the body to keep uh, blood in the upper part of the body so you stay conscious. Uh, things like that change in space and they readapt. Would the same thing occur with an older person going up into space? John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth in February of 1962 aboard the spacecraft Friendship 7. NASA Administrator Daniel Golden says he is giving the idea serious consideration. Keep smiling. Astronauts could be taking our picture from the U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia. This is a shuttle's eye view of planet Earth. When not snapping photos, the shuttle astronauts are performing experiments on metals. The results could lead to improvements in everything from computer chips to golf clubs. The astronauts on board the U.S. Space Shuttle Columbia are Space playing with control. fire. They're setting dozens of small controlled blazers in sealed chambers. The data gained should help improve fire safety in space. Deep space is a blind man. Dr. Kent Cullors says he's the first blind man on the planet to become a physicist. We will find extraterrestrial intelligence with all probability because the chances are very high that it exists. Dr. Cullors runs Project Phoenix at the privately funded SETI Institute. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 
Here, computers operate as sophisticated radio scanners, checking 28 million different frequencies in the microwave bands, filtering out the background noise of outer space in order to detect any possible transmissions from intelligent beings. The reason that I, as a blind physicist, can do this job is that I don't do it at all. My machines do it. Seven years ago, the late astronomer Carl Sagan mused about the prospect of hearing that first signal from extraterrestrial life. It will tell us that it is possible to pass through the stage of technological adolescence that we are in without destroying ourselves. That is very important information. The movie Contact, which opens Friday, is based on Sagan's book of the same name. In it, the signal finally does come. There is even a blind scientist based on Kent Cullors. Lead actress Jodie Foster is getting a reported $9 million for her role, more than twice the annual cost of the SETI Institute budget. There are those who think that listening for signs of intelligent life in outer space is a colossal waste of time and money. NASA did it for about 15 years, spending $58 million using equipment like these radio telescopes in California's Mojave Desert. But four years ago, a skeptical Congress cut off the funds. But some of the scientists who carry on the research using private grants estimate the universe could contain up to four trillion, yes, four trillion planets with intelligent life. And while they haven't heard a peep in 27 years of searching, they believe it's only a matter of time. And what will those other intelligent creatures be like? In the movies, the aliens either wear white hats or black hats. I mean, the good ones have big eyes, short noses, and wrinkly foreheads. They look like little E.T. The bad ones, of course, are here to destroy our cities and, and, and take over our planet. But the real ones may be so advanced they have no interest in us at all. Finding extraterrestrial intelligence is an admirable goal because it may change the way humans think about themselves. And On while Dr. Cullors knows it may not happen toys, in his lifetime, computers. he says he's keeping the champagne on ice just in case. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. Now to a look at the future. In the person of 11-year-old Chip Leggett of Austin, Texas, he is spending part of his summer at space camp at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and he gave us his thoughts on boldly going where no one has gone before, in his own words. I think that there has to be um, life in other parts of the universe, but I don't think there's any in this solar system besides what might have been on Mars. Besides, what are the chances of life forming on a single planet when there's over probably 100 billion other Earth-like planets out there? And just one? I don't think so. But I do hope there's life somewhere else. If there is, there's a chance that it would be more advanced than we are and that we could learn an awful lot from them, or they could learn, learn an awful lot from us. Starting to hurt a little. I don't worry about something like the classical horror movies where the aliens come and take over the Earth. It's what are the chances, like, again, of them being hostile? Two, one, and liftoff of space I do hope that they, I could be one of the few space travelers that would get to um, go to another planet. And I'm very proud about America finally going to Mars and beating everybody else to it in all this time span. It's just one of those things that it's kind of hard not to feel a little pride for the country. 11-year-old space camper Commander Chip Leggett in his own words tonight. Okay, I'm sorry, you're getting money to listen to... Uh... Yes, to try and fund uh, my... to search for signals from extraterrestrials. And this is based on a real story, right? Yes. By Carl Sagan. Yes. All right, let's take a look. Here's a scene from Contact. Want to hear something really nutty? I heard of a couple guys that want to build something called an airplane. You know, you get people to go in it and they fly around like birds. It's ridiculous, right? Or what about, what about uh, breaking the sound barrier? Or uh, rockets to the moon? Or atomic energy? Or a mission to Mars? Science fiction, right? Look, all I'm asking is, is for you to just have the tiniest bit of vision, you know, to, to step back for one minute and look at the big picture, to take a chance on something that just might end up being the most profoundly impactful moment for humanity, for, for the history of history. I'm sorry, I just, I just spent the last 13 months coming into rooms like this and talking to people like you and uh, the truth is you're my last chance so I'm sorry I wasted your time doctor yes sir 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have your money. NASA, once a federal agency on the ropes, is making the kind of comeback that faded stars dream about. And it's all thanks to a scrappy little robot whose pictures of Mars have captured the imagination of planet Earth. I'm really excited. I watch it every chance that I get. I still don't know how the telephone works. So when I see pictures from Mars, I'm, it's, it's awesome. The glory days of lunar landing seemed long gone when hydrogen leaks temporarily grounded NASA's shuttle fleet in 1990. That was the same year NASA discovered the Hubble Space Telescope couldn't focus, and a proposed space station was found to involve more spacewalks than anticipated. Liftoff of the Titan III rocket with the Mars Observer and... America. Not long after that, the Mars Observer vanished on its approach to Mars. Congress was becoming less and less impressed, a skepticism which lingers today. Well, at, on the one hand, we are trying to balance the budget. On the other hand, we're trying to explore the universe. At the same time, we're doing those two balancing acts. We are wasting almost $100 billion on the space station. I think we should be doing much more of the Pathfinder, the Hubble, uh, the uh, faster, cheaper, better missions that return great science. Since Dan Golden took the helm at NASA, he's had to phase out close to 4,000 jobs. Pathfinder has been both a public relations bonanza and a NASA morale booster. Now, not only do we have the rational support of the uh, Congress and the American people, I think we have the emotional support of the people because we've touched people's imaginations in their hearts. But even when the chips were down, space fans kept the dream of space exploration alive. To them, Pathfinder is a dream come true. Essentially what this is are the first steps towards eventually getting humans to the red planet. The space program has been doing some things that are very exciting. Uh, they've captured the public imagination. The National Space Society has been running Pathfinder's pictures on its website since the 4th of July weekend. Before that, the website took 300,000 hits a month. Now it's taking an average of a million hits a day. Luis Schiavone for CNN, Washington. Up on the shuttle Columbia, astronauts have lit more than 150 fires inside sealed combustion chambers. They're studying flames' odd attributes in weightlessness with an eye to understanding the dangers and potentials in space and on Earth. Researchers hope the tests will lead to more fuel-efficient engines. NASA was able to improve some of the tests after the mission was cut short in April because of a faulty fuel cell. Columbia and its crew of seven are due to land on Thursday. NASA says the shuttle Columbia appears to be in fine shape, though, for Thursday's scheduled landing. Its crew of seven is repacking science equipment after 16 days of experiments with fire, spinach, and clover. This mission was something of a repeat. To complete an $86 million research program cut short in April by a defective power generator. Other than a chance of ground fog, forecasters predict the weather will cooperate with Columbia's planned landing. CNN will provide live coverage on Thursday. Deutschland wird sich am Bau der internationalen Raumstation Alpha beteiligen. Das Bundeskabinett hat den entsprechenden Plan und die Finanzmittel heute verabschiedet. Das sichert und schafft Arbeitsplätze im Hightech-Bereich, auch in Bayern. Jens Krüger über den heutigen Blick des Bundeskabinetts hinaus in unendliche Weiten. Noch muss Bundesforschungsminister Rüttgers Raumschiffe aus Papier basteln. Doch in wenigen Jahren wird Deutschland eine echte Weltraumstation mitbetreiben. Das Bundeskabinett hat heute beschlossen, dass sich Deutschland am Bau der internationalen Raumstation Alpha beteiligt. Deutschland und seine europäischen Partner werden das Weltraumlabor Columbus beisteuern. Rüttgers wird aus seinem Etat 2,5 Milliarden Mark für den Bau des Labors bezahlen und so über 40 Prozent der Entwicklungskosten tragen. Das Labor soll unter Federführung deutscher Raumfahrtunternehmen gebaut werden und im Jahre 2002 an die Raumstation andocken. Die Raumstation ist das zentrale Aktionsfeld der deutschen Raumfahrt für die nächsten Jahre. Das ist das größte internationale Kooperationsvorhaben der bemannten Raumfahrt, das in diesen Jahren umgesetzt wird. Neben der Beteiligung an der Station hat das Kabinett ein neues Konzept für die deutsche Raumfahrt beschlossen. Künftig soll sie Geld verdienen statt Kosten. 
Die Raumfahrt müsse sich künftig als professioneller Dienstleister verstehen, forderte Rüttgers. Deswegen will die Bundesregierung auch die Vermarktung der europäischen Rakete Ariane vorantreiben. Bei zivilen Satellitenstarts hält die Ariane einen Weltmarktanteil von 50 Prozent. Nur wenn die Kosten begrenzt werden können, so der Forschungsminister, sei die Raumfahrt konsensfähig. Pictures from the US Shuttle Columbia. I had was I was uh, assigned prime on the Earth observation program which has been ongoing since the beginning of our space travel actually so I got to spend a lot of time looking out the window and um, the Earth is a beautiful sight here you see the Strait of Gibraltar Africa is in the bottom part of the screen and Spain is in the Spain and Europe are in the upper part and this is the Bahamas one of the most beautiful parts of the world I think due to the colors but Oceanographers and, and meteorologists and geologists are all interested in the types of photographs that we take from space. For instance, the um, folks in the weather office are interested in these von Kormann vortices off the Canary Islands in Africa. Even a 16-day flight eventually comes to an end. This is Susan packing up some of the equipment back in the Space Lab module. We do a little bit of, of packing as the, we get to the second to the last day, and then Jim and Susan check out the orbiter systems with Mike's help to make sure that the jets are working and the aerodynamic services will function properly so we can get safely back home. And then we finish up with the final closeout of the Space Lab module. All the experiments get shut down in a very orderly fashion, so we make sure all the science gets preserved and will survive the reentry and come back and allow everybody to analyze all the work that we were up there doing for those 16 days. The last payload activity is close the payload bay doors. We don't need the extra heat rejection capability anymore and once those doors get closed, we'll be coming home in just a few hours. Start the deorbit burn and head back to Kennedy Space Center. We had a nighttime entry and it was pretty spectacular looking out the overhead windows as you'll see coming up here. These are the uh, flashes out the overhead window as we enter the atmosphere, the plasma and ionization going off. It, it starts off just as bright flashes like giant flames, much larger than anything we'd seen in our combustion chambers. It changes after about five minutes into this little inverted mushroom structure you can see glowing there. And a few minutes later, it, it develops this white, uh, yellowish bright white uh, structure just glowing out there. It was really spectacular watching it for 10 or 15 minutes on entry. And this is a view as we passed over Houston at about Mach 10 or so, and uh, the people on the ground said they had a great view, and, and we had a great view out the window also of the glow. This picture's coming to you live now at the end of the shuttle's 16-day mission. It was a science mission that was cut short in April. Columbia, the oldest of NASA's four shuttles, due to touch down about three minutes from now. Again, these live pictures. The shuttle fired its braking rockets at about... Uh, an hour ago as it began to head towards Earth. The following is CNN's coverage of a live event. Hello, it's John Holloman at CNN Center in Atlanta. We're going to take you now live to the cockpit of Space Shuttle Columbia. The picture you see in the center of your screen is what the pilot is seeing, Susan Still. And uh, Commander Jim Halsell is on final approach for landing. The cross at the top of your screen is where the shuttle wants to, to touch down on this runway. The, um, uh, the line at the lower part of your screen, just left of the CNN, is the speed brake settings on the shuttle. The shuttle is slowing down now from 500 miles an hour to 300. We'll be listening to NASA's commentary as the shuttle makes its final approach and its touchdown on the runway. We will see, we are seeing, what the pilot and commander are seeing. degree approach as they uh, cross the threshold of runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center now at uh, 15 feet and 220 knots. 
and main gear touchdown. A pilot Susan Stills pushed to two buttons which deploy the drag chute as Commander Halso lowers the nose to the runway. And uh, nose gear touchdown. Beautiful landing for Columbia. Columbia's rolling out on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center, completing 251 orbits of the Earth while traveling 6.2 million miles. STS-94 completes the microgravity science laboratory mission begun with STS-83 this spring. As the shuttle rolls to a full stop on runway 33, which is the north-facing runway at the Kennedy Space Center, we will remind you that there is another breaking story in space involving the Russian Mir space station. Again, this is the pilot's eye view as the shuttle rolls to a stop. Uh, unprecedented pictures from NASA uh, with a camera in the cockpit, which we've been watching for the past couple of minutes. Uh, uh, the astronaut and the two cosmonauts aboard Mir are now in the Mir rescue vehicle because they've unplugged all the power in the main part of the Mir space station inadvertently. This is a developing story that we are following. NASA says no danger. They're in the rescue ship, and all three of them have not ever been in the rescue ship uh, before. Uh, which indicates, uh, despite NASA's indication that uh, things are fine, uh, it's a very dangerous situation on board Mir right now. We'll continue to monitor that and the flight of Space Shuttle Columbia, which has just ended quite successfully at Florida's Kennedy Space Center. That concludes our live coverage of the shuttle landing. We urge you to stay tuned to CNN and CNN International for more developments on the uh, situation, which is uh, not being called an emergency, but sounds to me like one, on board the Russian Mir space station. John Holloman, CNN reporting. This has been a CNN Live event. Nach 16 Tagen im All ist die US-Raumfähre Columbia heute sicher zur Erde zurückgekehrt. Bei Sonnenaufgang setzte das Shuttle mit seiner siebenköpfigen Crew an Bord auf dem Gelände des Kennedy-Weltraumzentrums auf. Die Mannschaft hatte über 30 Experimente und 206 kontrollierte Explosionen ausgeführt. Mit ihrer erfolgreichen Mission machte sie einen verpatzten Flug vom April wieder wett. Entry is spectacular, just in a different way, but just as, as interesting uh, as Ascent is. Uh, the, the crew suited up and fired up here for the last task of the flight, which is to land successfully. Uh, here's a heads-up display view of the information that's projected in front of Susan and myself and our windows as we look outside. In the insert, you can see us flying around that large heading alignment uh, cone, the actual turn on to final approach to the runway. When we do roll out on final approach, we dive down at a uh, steep dive angle, 18 degrees, about uh, six times greater than what you would in a normal airliner. Of course, we can't land like that, so at 2,000 feet above the ground, I pull the nose up to a more normal one and a half degree interglide slope. Uh, here we are at, uh, at 300 feet. In the upper left-hand signal, you see the GR. That's for gear. That means that Susan has just put the gear down at 300 feet, as she's supposed to. I guide the uh, aircraft down to a safe landing uh, 3,000 feet down the runway and just about at our design speed of uh, 202 knots indicated airspeed. At 195 knots, I put the nose down and Susan pops a chute. It inflates right there just before the uh, nose hits the ground so as to uh, cushion the impact of the uh, nose wheel slap down. And it just worked exactly the way the engineers had designed it to. And that concludes our 16-day flight. Hope you enjoyed the film. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding. Where we're standing by now to enter the suit up room to see the STS-94 astronauts. There's our commander, Jim Halsell, being assisted with his launch and entry suit. And our pilot, Susan Still, with her helmet on, as if she's ready to go. And our payload commander, mission specialist number one, Janice Foss. Crew will be heading out for the launch pad in about another 15 minutes. Thank you.
Don Thomas once again. And to payload specialist, uh, or mission specialist, Mike Gernhardt, and then payload specialist, Roger Crouch. At T minus two hours, 58 minutes, 50 seconds, and counting, this is shuttle launch control. And here we see our STS-94 astronauts now leaving the suit-up room, headed for the elevator. Also, astronaut Bob Cabana and flight crew coordinator Dave Liesma is with them. Bob Cabana will be flying the weather reconnaissance aircraft a little bit later on. And down below, the astronaut van waiting, along with a crowd of Kennedy Space Center employees and press members waiting to wish them off. Trip down three floors in the elevator. And there are other Kennedy Space Center employees just inside the door waiting to wish them well. And here they come. And we're coming up on the T minus nine minute built in hold in about eight seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, T minus nine minutes and holding for ten minutes. And CRTC, we're going to configure uh, CRTs for asset. Roger that, sir. We'd also like to inflate our suits at this time. Copy that. Launch Roger, director, director, office manager. Go ahead. Jim, the MMT has no other issues. Uh, you're now cleared to launch. Copy that. And uh, Columbia, it looks like we've got the weather lined up with us, so we're going to uh, try and get you guys out of here. So have a good flight, and NTD, you're clear to launch. I copy. C3 copy. Thank you, Jim. CBLS entity. TLS go. The countdown clock will resume on my mark. Five, four, three, two, one, mark. T minus nine minutes and counting. TLS other sequence has been initiated. Orbiter access arm can be moved back into position in less than 30 seconds should any kind of emergency arise. And in just about another minute, we'll start the pre start sequence for the auxiliary power units. Engines are gimbling now. Steering check on the main engines. Caution, warning, memory clear, not expected errors. Up to PLT. T minus two minutes, 15 seconds. OTC, are we going to close and lock your visors, initiate O2 flow? I wish you got speed, Columbia, keep the dream alive. 
because of that. Thanks, and we want to congratulate everybody here at the Cape that made this record-breaking breaking turnaround possible. We'll take good care of the ship and see you in 16 days. And we copy. Thank you. Fifteen. Sound suppression water system activated. Ten. D minus ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Main engine start. Three. Two. One. Zero. And liftoff of Columbia with the Microgravity Science Laboratory, a research bridge to the International Space Station. Houston. Roger roll, Columbia. Houston is now controlling. Roll maneuver is uh, complete aboard Columbia. The orbiter is now in a heads down position on course for a 28 and a half degree, 160 nautical mile orbit. Now at 30 seconds, the uh, three engines aboard the orbiter will begin uh, throttling down as the vehicle prepares to pass through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Standing by for a burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters, which signals the end of first stage. SRB separation is confirmed two minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. Columbia is now at an altitude of 31 miles downrange from the launch site, 35 miles. Columbia, performance is nominal. One minute, 30 seconds remaining in powered flight uh, as uh, Columbia heads out now across the Atlantic Ocean. Columbia, single engine press, 104. Single engine press, 104. And with that call to uh, Commander Jim Halsell from uh, Dom Gorey here in Mission Control, Columbia can reach orbit on one engine now should two of them fail. But again, all three are still in excellent shape. The hydraulic, hydraulic systems, uh, APUs, are performing well, as are the fuel cells, which produce the electricity for all of the orbiter systems. Columbia, Houston, uh, for Jim, go for the priority Group B power down. Okay, thank you.
That's good. On the uh, question module one, the experiment module in there right now is a uh, softball experiment. We're running, running very lean mixtures, usually of hydrogen and oxygen and diluent. So we get these unique type of combustion called flame balls, which are a very, very weak flame, only possible in zero gravity. Wow. A little bit further down. We have the droplet combustion module, ex the droplet combustion experiment, and uh, they're dro burning single heptane droplets, which are deployed in zero gravity. Uh, we were very fortunate yesterday that uh, investigators decided to put uh, lab laboratory air into the chamber and burn heptane with air, so that now we can directly compare all the experiments that had been done in the fiber-supported droplet combustion experiment next door here with the results from the droplet combustion experiment. So this is really a terrific uh, result, and, and the droplets uh, burned beautifully. Janice did the experiments last night while I was sleeping. Uh, good coordination between the ground and Janice, and they pulled those runs off, and apparently they're going to try and do some more burns today, which I'm really excited about. Great. Uh, Right now in the glove box we have CSLM, which is uh, the coarsening of the solid liquid melts, basically looking at the increase in grain size in two different metals as they're mixed. And because you don't want sedimentation, this is very uh, amenable to microgravity research. A lot of the other glove box experiments have been put away. Uh, LIF is over here. That's an experiment, a material science experiment, where we study uh, essentially metallurgy in a very high temperature furnace. Beyond that, we have the phase experiment down here, which is uh, studying the fundamental properties of the fundamentals of the solidification process. Above that is Astro PGBA, basically a little tiny greenhouse inside with uh, fluorescent lights and water supply and uh, atmosphere control. We're growing all kinds of little plants in there, spinach, lal lolly pine, sage, and periwinkle. What happens is that a micro a plant has to decide how to portion up its energy between lignans, which are the support materials, starches and sugars, which are energy, and these secondary metabolites, which are chemicals, for example, which might repel insects and keep it safe. Because we use plants for different purposes, the ability to manipulate how a plant uses its energy for those three different purposes is very valuable. In space, plants may, propor may proportion their energy differently and produce different amounts of those different types of compounds. And that's one important thing we're studying in Astro PGBA. Over here is a Tempest experiment, another material science metallurgy experiment. A lot of what they're doing is studying uh, physical properties of metals in their subcooled state. So you take a metal and you cool it down beyond its normal melting point. And if you're very careful, you can get the, to the metal to go significantly below its melting point. But to do that, you have to have a device which can keep it from contacting other surfaces. And so this is a magnetic levitation experiment where the, the metal sample is levitated between magnetic uh, electrical coils and is both heated and its position controlled from those coils. 
Uh, another thing they can do is perturb the liquid metal after it's melted and then study its uh, oscillations, which tells us about tells us about the viscosity and surface ten surface tension of the metal. So we can get physical properties of metals in their metal in their melted state from this device. Workbench rack is a lot like it would be on Earth, place to do work. We have these nice straps to hold down our books as we uh, tape new pages in. We have drawers full of uh, spare things that we need to use. For example, we have cables in here and uh, bags and fuse kit. Here we have probably the most useful thing on this entire spaceship, which is duct tape, without which space travel itself would not be possible. <laughs> we have uh, sound level analyzers and also uh, force cages. We have Ziploc bags, a plethora of useful things. Up here is our, one of our tool drawers. Let me pull that open for you. Okay. We have this nice name tag on the side here that tells us where everything is so we don't have to pull the drawers out every time to look for something. And here are some of the tools. Allen wrenches, screwdrivers, and whatnot. So it's going to be very handy. We have a very well-equipped tool case which, which can be used to solve most of the little minor repair jobs that come up in the space. This furnace is from the Japanese Space Agency and it's a cooperative program between NASA and NASDA. The cartridges look something like this. They have a protective cover over them. This is a sample that was run yesterday and taken out of the sample this morning. This is a protective coating and then this is a cover to protect the inside of the furnace from the corrosive chemical reaction of the materials that are used in this particular sample. Examples of the kinds of experiments we're doing here are diffusion coefficients or measurement of movement of different uh, materials within a material or impurities or things that are expected to give better properties to the material such as in semiconductors or electronic crystals.
just beautiful. And I'm going to go up here. Okay. Put it away. This is just... Okay, now we're going to this is exciting space television. Think of okay. doing a day to take here and uh, knowing that it will, uh, this maybe isn't the peak uh, frequency, but it'll find the right frequency to oscillate at. Because I'm getting pretty good uh, oscillations, amplitudes on the display here. Okay, and my uh, AM tuning is at 32 decimal 3 right now. Science here. Okay, sorry. Gotta do some science. This guy's not gonna get nothing.
live downlink video is coming from aboard the Space Lab module as the crew of the Shuttle Columbia currently perform a, uh, an experiment in the combustion module one titled laminar soot processes experiment and now we're receiving live downlink video from inside that combustion module in the actual experiment itself. bad news for DC. Paul's got a lot of extra <laughs> fuel on board. We might get a lot of stuff on. Oh, because you run out of other things. Yeah. I don't know how fast we can turn around. But... Or how long you can stay up continually. <laughs> Good point. Where is Susan? Susan, you got a big day today. Got a big day? Compactor ops. Why? Actually, it's pretty big. You got that and you got the uh, WDAS. Yeah, big WDAS. And we have a uh, PAO contact also. So, we actually have uh, some full lines. Yeah. OCA S band. They want to do S band. OCA S band? Yeah, just to practice it. <laughs> because that's the way they're going to use it on the right? actual, yeah. Just on the actual what? Uh, space station. full of happy campers. <laughs> Okay. Okay. 
but that hurt. It did. That hurt. Hey. What about the one I found more up on the point there? Just keep it going when we get the trash out. Okay. Take the trash and see what you're at. Posterior go through the hatch. Wow. Yeah, I missed my tailbone. What is that? We're about to do contact lenses. Can you see what that one is? Yeah. Can we film that? No. Okay. Uh, Scientist, astronaut, extraordinary, extraordinary. Sleeps with the video. I missed that your TV player. And he's gonna smack his head getting in his bunk. To lose. It's just following him in. <laughs> Here's Charles Atlas washing his hair. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's just keep, soup, huh? okay. Just keep. Okay. Just fake it then. Fake it a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay. And that's a. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Huh? Well, I got a little bit around the side. I got a little bit around the side. Rubbing, okay. rubbing. Drying your hair. You're drying your hair. You're drying your hair. I need five or ten more seconds. Keep drying. Keep drying. Ooh, there wrong you go. Side. Yeah. There you go. Wrong side. There. You go. Space Station Mir, this is KC-5 RNI, Space Shuttle Columbia. Space Shuttle Mir, Space Shuttle Mir, this is KC-5 RNI, Space Shuttle Columbia. I think I'm hearing Mike call the... And you can see this is a note to my parents, Jim and Louise Vaughn, which I'm talking about my day off. We do have a communications link once a day. We can get mail up and down. And I have lots of friends and relatives that send me mail every day. And this is how I write back to them so that they can hear what we're doing up here in space. All right, that ought to be enough to This is eight.
that you're watching, we don't get to see it anymore. Yeah, well, unless you want to stow it in your uh, entry flight data file bag or something. Another bag, though, coming up. Oh, My flight sure. controller power is coming on. I have a hot stick. We're still in auto. Copy on at the 90. Copy on at the 90. I do not see the runway yet. I see the lights, though. Okay, you have MLS. Copy. There's the runway. And we're going through 15,000. 15,000. Good. Runway inside, Houston. Copy, Tim. The runway's inside. Good nap. Below 10. 
Okay. okay, approach and land, body flap to trail. Okay, right on. I see one white, we're going for the nominal. I see on and on. Okay. 300 knots. Right down center line. Okay. 5,000. Good radar. That'd be good radar. Boards commanding 21. Copy. 1,000 pre flare. And the pre flare on the gear. Here's arm, good light. Copy. 1,000. 500. 400. Gear is coming. Ball bar. Booming on me a little bit. Slightly high. Just high on the ball bar. You're down. Up right there on the ball. 5240. 3230. 2215. 5207. 195. Shoot. 185. Derotate. 2-2. Nice landing. Thank you. Right Auto-lead release. Good job, Jim. Sir. 120, breaking 6. 110, breaking 5. Coming easy on the brakes. 100 knots, breaking 7. 90, breaking 8. 80, breaking 7. 70 knots. Shoots jettisoning. Let go. 40 knots, he's off. And off. Lining up the center line, hopefully. Looks good to me. Okay. Wheel stop. Wheel stop. All right. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Welcome home, Columbia. Congratulations on a perfect mission. Thank you, Dom. Uh, it's great to be up there, and it's good to be back. Thank you. Columbia's uh, speed is down to 5,200 miles per hour. Columbia, energy, ground track, and nav are go. Copy. Down. Uh, Columbia's altitude is 86,000 feet, range 77 miles. Columbia, Houston, we can take GPC number five to standby. Happy GPC five to standby.
stand by just Two, a we copy that. SSME repo is complete, and you have a go for APU high shutdown. Copy, shutting down APU. 514 at the bottom. Okay. Uh, we're at 514 at the top. Okay. You said uh, you had to go... Yeah. Columbia, Houston, you have a go for LRU deactivation. Copy, thank you. 